welcome back to the Notaku Anime Chat. I'm your resident subtitle only lover, Setsuken, alongside the one who rarely watches dubs, Guardian Enzo. Yeah, I yeah, rarely is right. Uh but yes, good morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. It's a really exciting day today, I think, because today's the day, dear listeners, Guardian Enzo, that we hit our 13th episode. We've made it all the way to a core. Yay! Yes. Yay, we survived. Yeah, and I think the I, I do want to take a second, as that's the big announcement this week, to talk about how big of a deal that is. Because Guardian Enzo, if you remember, last time we tried this, we hit four episodes, and not even four. We hit, yeah, I think it was four, and then there was a fifth extra episode. So, dear listeners, and we'll get more into the survey stuff later, a lot of you were worried that we were going to stop. I think the fact that we hit 13 episodes and we're still going strong is a good indication of the fact that we're very, very much invested and interested. Wouldn't you say, Guardian Enzo? Oh, sure, yeah, and uh, uh, committed to to growing and uh, making this bigger and better as in, in smart ways. Yes, yes, and speaking of commitment, let's just jump right into the thing that we're committed to starting off the show with every week, user feedback. So, not user, listener feedback. If you're a user of the podcast, I want to know how you use it. Um, oh, actually, we, we had a survey for that. So there are people who use it to get through certain parts of their day. Anyway, Princess, Princess Usagi, who again continues to uh, mention stuff on YouTube, which I appreciate. YouTube comments definitely help us out a lot more um, and help propagate the show, um, as do reviews and other things. So she, uh, Guardian Enzo, she talked about the... Uh, Halloween episode and talked about some of the stuff that you had talked about night stalker and the blob. And I think you responded to her uh, right there in the comments. Mm. Uh, But one thing that I did want to highlight was what she talked about with Zetsu and no Tempest uh, Magi and all that stuff. Um, She also said that I completely forgot there was an anime from the seventies or eighties about Anne of green Gables. And I think I actually looked this up later. There's a ton of anime about like, uh, I think there's a Miss Marple anime. There's an Agatha Christie anime. There's uh, stuff for um, Heidi and all these like classic tales. So there's a lot of classic literature anime. I just don't know if it's very good. Wouldn't you? What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there's the whole anime masterpiece theater series too. I mean, we we barely touched on those, but there were, uh, you know, I don't know how many, I don't know how many world masterpiece theater. I think it was called, but there that was for a few years that ran. I think there were, and it even it ran for a long time, then it went away and it came back. And they did like a Dog of Flanders, and they did they did a Moomin adaptation. And uh, they did something about the, the the trap family from Sound of Music, Les Mis, uh, Petit Cosette. I mean, Les Mis, Petit Cosette was actually a pretty pretty popular anime uh, yes. adaptation of Les Mis. So yeah, I mean, uh, we could have talked on that topic for half an hour easily. There's tons of stuff that we never got to. I think we just focused on stuff that sort of struck us as being particularly interesting or relevant to our our own interests, you know. Yes, sir. And uh, I I do want to quick mention, she talked about Higurashi and Chiki and the relationship between those two. And I think you said that you like Chiki better. In a responsive comment, Flair and I said that he likes Higurashi better. And I agreed with him there. So just uh, that diversity of opinion, which is, I think, something else that we'll talk about when we get to the survey stuff. So yes, I, I realize I'm teasing a lot about the survey. But before we get into that, the last piece of feedback that I want to talk about is for Jan over at Lost in Anime. And he he just said a bunch of different things. Some of these, um, I, I was fairly uh, funny to read. He talked about how he doesn't actually work two hours, work out two hours a week. He actually just works out every day for a bit and then chunks the podcast out, which is good to hear because two hours is, I think, Unless you're like an athlete or something, that's a lot to that's work a big out. Workout, on. yeah. Honestly, that's how I listen back to it. Is I listen to it in chunks as I'm either exercising or doing other stuff in, around around the house. I listen to a half an hour here, twenty minutes there, 
Uh, I don't sit down and listen to our whole two hours at once, you know, so that's a long time to sit down and listen to a podcast. Same. What I do is I, uh, I have a speaker, a Bluetooth speaker that I can put in the shower. So I listen to some of it while I'm showering and then I continue when I uh, am working and programming. So it's a good, and we'll get more into how people use it, but yeah, I just wanted to, that was a correction worth pointing out. Cause I think we had mentioned that some people were uh, working out for two hours and stuff like that. So good, good little, little piece of feedback there. And then the final thing, which I think is worth mentioning is he mentioned, can you please leave politics out of the podcast and i know you responded to him uh in lost uh, at lost in anime but i wanted to talk about this as well because i think i kind of agree with him i i know we were we were not really directly trying to uh reference politics too much it's always in a joking way but i think i respect the fact that we might be uh, a break from reality for a lot of people, you know, a, a way to kind of unwind and not think about the dumpster fire that is 2020 and all the stuff that's happening. And so I think we can, we definitely were never intending to make this a political podcast and I don't think it ever will be, but we definitely want to uh, maybe even tone it down a, a little bit more and uh, maybe the zingers and stuff like that uh, just by their relationship to, reality and maybe break that illusion of the break or the 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 seclusion from the world that people may need for like an hour or two every week so uh from my perspective i will try harder to not make the little jokes and the things like that because i think um there's tons of people and more talented comedians doing that stuff. Anything to add, Guardian End Zone? That's yeah, what? yeah. At first, that I that I appreciate Jan for uh, being a a long time and active contributor over at LIA and now with Notaku, uh, and uh, definitely respect his views on this. And just to you know, I I to, I to be honest, I kind of disagree uh, because I think as long as you don't get partisan about it, I mean, I think I think. When when the elephant in the room is is uh, is something so so big as elephants tend to be, I think ignoring it is almost calling attention to it in a way. Ironically, and I think just by talking about it, even in this context, we're sort of we're sort of doing exactly what he said he didn't want us to do, but which is also ironic. Uh, so I mean, I, I'm going to make the I, you know I'm going to make the occasional zinger. It's just it's I can't not do it. It's 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 in my nature. It's a congenital it's a congenital defect, if you will, with me. I have to make the occasional zinger on that kind of stuff. But yeah, we're it's definitely never going to be a politics podcast. And I get the idea that we want to be a break uh, from you know from from the stresses of the world. And Lord knows there are plenty. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, and Jan also followed up to my response to him as saying, yeah, that's totally cool. I get where you're coming from. So I don't think it's like even a big deal really for him, as long as we don't get partisan about it. And I certainly never intend to do that. So yes, we, we hear you. I, you know, um, you know, sets can maybe more than me. We'll try to abide by that, but it's definitely going to be it, it, at the most, it's going to be the occasional, it's going to be the occasional nonpartisan one-off uh, like the, like the Boris Johnson peeking in the window thing. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's, that's just, it's it just, it's golden Kamui style, low ball humor. That's all it is. So, uh, and I can't promise that'll never happen again, but we'll definitely keep it in mind. Yes. That is all we can ask for. And I think, uh, that also dear listeners gives you an idea of, you know, Guardian Enzo and I don't agree on everything, uh, I think we agree in, on a lot of things, but obviously there's differences of opinion. So I think you can do that. You can be civil, have a conversation. We're always listening. And besides just listening, what we're also doing is watching things. So let's get into the first part of our podcast. What we're watching. It's another week of anime watching for us here at Notaku and for everybody else who's hopefully part of our little community here so this week we'll we'll keep with our one series a week thing and i'll start off with the major second which i think i alluded to last week that i wanted to talk about and something really interesting happened between this week and the last week in that a major bombshell was dropped and there's a big twist and i think some people really liked it but for me it almost came out of nowhere 
Um, and because of that, I, I just wasn't, that almost kind of soured the series in some ways for me. It's almost like they, they created something really exciting at the end, but it just didn't work tonally for me between what had been happening before and stuff like that. And major second, I don't know, I, I, I'm kind of jumping right into it, but major second for me has been kind of a, a series that I have liked. It's taken a very different angle. Uh, from the original series, which I, I uh, on your recommendation, Guardian Enzo, I ended up watching. But this second series, it's a different series. Uh, I think you've you've talked about it eloquently, and I'll let you talk about it a little more in a bit. But Daigo, the main character, is very different from his father, who was the original uh, protagonist for the major series. And we're kind of seeing his journey right now. What's interesting about Major Second's current season is that he's on an all-girls team. Almost. Almost, almost. And it's a very interesting dynamic um, that, you know, and the manga is asking some really interesting questions with all of that. I think that part of the series both works for me and it doesn't. I like the idea of a middle school team with primarily girls and them being the dominant players and then Daigo kind of being the person who's kind of managing them as their coach and their captain and kind of building them up. What I don't like as much is the the undertones that I keep seeing of like this being kind of a harem show. And there's almost a sexualization of some of the girls who are middle school students, I should say, particularly egregious is the ending theme. I think for me where uh, you get these shots of them in like these sultry poses with their shoes kind of off and that kind of stuff. So there's that element of it that kind of makes me uncomfortable. But then some of the storytelling up till the last episode has made me uh, kind of enjoy it. So that's my thoughts on that one. Uh, what do you think, Guardian Enzo, about Major Second? Well, this is this is a franchise that I really love. So I, I could go on uh, at length about this to be sure. I'll try to keep it relatively brief. Um, as far as the fan service, honestly, to me, that's kind of a nothing burger. I mean, I, I think it, it's only because this is a sports show uh, that that people sometimes find it out of place. It, 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 it's been all of all of the entire run of major. It, there's been almost no occasions where it's bothered me, quite frankly, um, maybe one or two, but generally speaking, I'm, I'm fine with it. I, 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 I think we see so much worse in, in, in other series that get away with it because it's just seen as being part of their part of their genre or whatever. And it's just like, Oh, it's just, that's just that sort of series. I'm like, well, Okay, double standard much, but 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 don't you think? Quick, 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 one thing, one thing. But don't you think it just tonally doesn't make sense with this series and this franchise? Because even Major Second Part One didn't have this. No, because because the Major Second Part One they were in sixth grade and there were hardly any girls in it, and it was different. And you know, I I don't think that they're being sexualized really. I think they're just kind of just other than like the eye catches and, and occasionally, which if I've also put Daigo in those two, I might point out. But um, so I, I, I don't know. I, 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 again, I feel like it's a, it's a, to me, it's, I'm the wrong person to ask because to me it's, it's a nothing burger. I just, to me, it's, it just doesn't, it barely registers with me. And, you know, we may hint, hint, we may talk about fan service a little bit in this episode, but I'm pretty sensitive to it when it's crass and I don't find it to be crass here, but Hey, maybe I've got my blinders on. It's possible. I love major. That's certainly true. Um, And I don't want to spend, you know, all of our segment talking about that aspect of the show, which I think is like the 219th most important element of it. Uh, The the other points you raised, I think, I think are kind of more on my radar as far as the, the girls being so prominent. I'm kind of with you. I mean, first of all, on the whole, I love the series. You know, I think this season has been great. I think the first season was great. They've been very different, but they're both great to me. Um, I think the girls being the dominant force on the team is an, is a very interesting thing from a narrative standpoint. And I kind of like where uh, Mitsuda is going with it. From a realism standpoint, you lose something because, and I'm just being honest here, at the middle school level, a team with only like two guys on it is not going to be able to compete at a high level in the district and, and you know, the perfectual tournaments and stuff. It's, it's, I'm just being honest. It's not going to happen. 
Um, the only girl on that team who's really, really strong enough to be on a team that's competing at the level with some of the opponents we've seen, uh, like Sujido and stuff, would be Sawa. Uh, I agree. Who, who is she's she? I mean, there are, but she's uh, and there are girls like her, and she's an exception. Like like you know like um, Alba from. Uh, Alba from Cross Game would be another example. If she had been allowed to compete uh, at the uh, with the boys at the high school level, she could certainly have been a part of the team. But even even with Alba, you could see that she was not dominating when going up against the guys once she got to the high school level. And the higher you go in, in the age group, the harder it is for a straight up head on competition for the girls. To, to to you know to really be high level performers that's just realism uh, and you could see a team with a couple of really exceptionally talented girls on it at the middle school level but not a team where there's only two guys it's just it's just not it's just not realistic but I think that's kind of a suspension of disbelief thing and you go along with it because it's it it the story itself it does some very interesting things with the story. Uh, and I love Daigo as a lead because he is so different from his father. And I think Goro was a great sports anime protagonist. And I think that Daigo is a great sports anime protagonist. But the best part about it is they're great for totally different reasons. And they're totally different people. Uh, I just, I would also say that for me, Goro is like probably the worst anime dad since... Uh, worst so me human being. Since Gendo Ikari. I mean, he's... I mean, I honestly, I don't think he's a bad human being. I just think he's a weak man. And but yes. the fact that the fact that he's a weak man, and that's not to say he's a bad person. There's a difference. Uh, and I think that, but the fact that he is a weak man manifests itself in him in him being a bad dad. And I think that there's a difference between being a bad dad and being a bad person. I honestly do believe that. But because I, I don't think he's like intentionally. Uh, he's in, he's not intentionally screwing over his kids, but that is what he's doing, especially Daigo, because Daigo has really been the one. His sister is much more confident in herself. She's much more, she's much more, sometimes that can be a front, but she seems to be more confident in her, and she's a more exceptional physically in her age group as an athlete. She hasn't needed his direct support as much as Daigo has. Like when we went through that whole first season with, with Hikaru being injured, and Daigo blaming himself for it. And that whole instance, he needed to be there for his kid, and he wasn't. And the thing that really irritates me most about Daigo as a dad is how he'll like show up for like a day and then disappear again. And it's yeah. like, fuck you, man. I mean, seriously. Uh, you know, he's he's almost like a divorced dad who puts in an appearance on the weekend, except he's still married to his wife. <laughs> and it's sad. But the thing is that there are there are people like him. And there are a lot of fathers like him, and he's somebody he's 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 married to baseball, and he's obsessed with baseball, and he can't allow himself to to identify with with as a person more than as a baseball player. So he desperately strives to hang on to a connection to baseball any way he can, uh, even at the expense of his family. And I think that's actually kind of sad. And if he were the protagonist of this series, you could make a very interesting series built around that. But what we end up with instead really is a series about Daigo learning to be self-sufficient and learning to believe in himself. And he gets little bits of help from, you know, from Hikaru's dad and from Toshia and, and from, and from Sakura is always there for him and all this stuff. And, but you know, which is really interesting in and of itself. Now, as far as the, the development I assume you don't want to get into the specifics of that for spoiler reasons, why don't, right? Why don't we why don't we warn them about spoilers and yeah. jump into it? Yeah, okay. Cause so so big spoiler coming. And as as I said on my, my intro to my post on last week's uh, episode was I subscribe to I'm I follow Japan Earthquakes on Twitter and I was pissed off that I didn't get a tweet before this episode aired. Uh because it was a big one. Uh but basically Hikaru shows up and, as a member of Suji Do. And, um, but now he's a catcher because he can't, uh, he can't pitch anymore. Apparently we don't know any details on this yet because of, uh, the injury he suffered after the collision with Daigo, which was his fault readers, just so you know, um, it was, it was Hikaru's fault if anybody's fault, although it was totally an accident. So, but the thing is the, the thing that's really kind of creepy and I think intentionally so I think it's set up this way is that it, you get the vibe that he's sort of 
come full circle and now he blames Daigo for what happened, which would, at least that's the vibe I took away from it. We're going to know a lot more after tonight's episode, so that'll be very interesting to see. Uh, I, I came out of left field, pun intended, uh, but uh, I'm okay with it really because there was almost no way you could have looped Hikaru back into the story without it coming out of left field. So I think this is this this was this is as good a way as any to do it for me. I just hope they don't over milk this drama and turn it into a big dark feud between the two of them because now Hikaru blames him for it, yada yada. Because I think that would be a little forced. And but I'm not convinced yet that that's what's going to happen. So I feel like I have to withhold my judgment on that until after the episode tonight. Wow, I thought you would disagree with me about the Hikaru thing, but I think we're on the same page there. Well, ask me tomorrow. Ask me tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, my whole thing was I was so invested in the the really interesting idea of the the girls team and Daigo, and I know they uh, kind of threw a, a curveball uh, earlier in the season. Pun intended. With uh, Michiru. Yeah, another pun. Lots of baseball puns. Yeah. Uh, with Michiru and how she almost was taking uh, the rubber baseball a bit too lightly. Mm. Um, and, you know, when she came up against this team and saw all these girls doing fairly well and that, that high. That to me was very interesting. Yeah. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why the fan service, I think, bothers me a little bit more because it cheapens what is honestly a good story. And I, I, my guess is that it's not in the manga, but people can tell me about that. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. Oh, damn. Okay. Well, uh, but, but, but that idea was so interesting. And Daigo coming in as a leader and stuff like that. I think introducing Hikaru at this point and an evil Hikaru or a Hikaru that's kind of turning into his dad because his dad has the, had these moments uh, in the original major where he would just kind of become the antagonist for an arc or two and then he would come back or whatever. Right. Um, onto the good side, as it were. <laughs> Yeah. So um, if that's what it is, it just feels like almost a major trope coming back. But I, I, I hadn't even considered the fact that maybe you're right. It's just not a thing. The final thing I wanted to say really quick is I think Goro's a bad human being because he's self-centered. He's very selfish. And I think a lot of he takes advantage of a lot of the people that love him and care for him. Like I agree. his wife. I agree. His children and everything. And I... I loved Goro in the original series, and even there, it kind of bugged me a little bit how much people enabled his bad behavior, but it's just off the charts. It's just off the charts. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. He's always been like this. It's just that when you see him in where his main role should be as a father, those faults yeah. become much more. Because the things that are faults when you are when you don't have kids, they can be more forgivable. But yeah. you're supposed to grow past that when you have kids, right? Yes. And he hasn't. And he hasn't. Um, and that makes him come off a lot worse. Yes. As I think it's intended to. And to, to give Mitsuda's credit, I think it's intended. I think we're supposed to see him. I think you could have an interesting argument about whether we're supposed to see him as a, as a bad dad or not. I think we are personally. What do you think? I think so, too. I think it's intentional. And I think one of the things that I will credit the mangaka for is the fact that he has been very consistent. Daigo didn't magically... Oh, it's not Daigo, sorry. Goro didn't di uh, magically become a, an adult and start being a good dad all of a sudden. He is right. who he is. Right. But I do want to see when all this is said and done, when Major Second is winding down and, and all that, I want to see Goro grow in the end. I would love to see that. Um, I think, I think that would be, I, I don't want to see his character left in the state he's in now as kind of this emotional child. I would like to see him grow out of it. But that being said, I think Daigo is a wonderful and emotionally satisfying protagonist. I really do. I think it's great to see a sports series about a kid who isn't, not only isn't a great athlete, but has to carry the weight of his father and sister being great athletes, especially his father, who's famous for it and overcome that just by being, he is, you know, I, I he's what we call a servant leader. I don't know. Are you familiar with the whole servant leadership uh, philosophy? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's, yep. Daigo is a, a thousand percent servant leader. That's what he is. And, um, you know, I think Daigo is, is I, I can't overstate what a good protagonist he is because he is 
such a complex and 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 ultimately I think very courageous person because he he confronts the things that he doesn't love about himself and he manages to overcome them that they're still there and you know they're still there those insecurities are still there but he but he overcomes that and um you know especially because he's such just generally such a you know such a great kid it's i mean how can you not love daigo how can you not root for daigo he's just such a great kid and and to see him struggling with the things he struggles with a lot of sports anime they have the plucky hero like hinata who i love hinata he's great but it's not you don't see the psychological depth to the insecurities that we see with daigo i think in most of these in most of this class of sports anime protagonist that's in in my in my opinion yes all right we we did a very good discussion on major which i think love major yeah yeah which i think is kind of making me think that what we're watching could be a bigger thing later on mm. but um and we might even shorten this down to one series that we just really care about so we'll we'll keep thinking about that but guardian enzo give me something really quick for what you're watching and then we'll move on ahead yeah don't worry i because there's nothing i'm watching that I, i'm going to put anywhere near on the same level as major because the stuff that i that i am really deeply into is stuff we've talked about already a lot in the last couple of episodes like golden kamui and uh and Moyarty. So uh, I'll briefly throw out just to remind our readers, speaking of going over to the dark side with Toshia, that uh, the Mandalorian is back this week. So more baby Yoda. Yay. Um, as a non anime thing, I'll talk about Osamatsu san season three, uh, only because I've had this kind of deep and underlying suspicion that the writer and director uh, did not want to continue this series that really felt like, that the ship had sailed, that it had run its course. I think they were shocked by how huge a monumental a hit it turned out to be. They weren't prepared for that. Um, you know, and if you watch osamatsu san you know the type of show this is. You then they have it, it's very hard to write this kind of comedy week after week after week, totally originally from scratch. So I and the first episode was really basically dedicated. There's a lot of not only third wall breaking with fourth wall breaking with the show, but there's also a lot of like self French referential stuff. And the whole thing with you, why are we doing this? What's the point? Why did we come back for another season? It really almost felt to me like a cry for help from from them. But the last episode was really funny. They've introduced two new characters this season who are these two AIs that have been assigned mysteriously assigned to help out the sex triplets. And uh, they've really been a very interesting addition to the chemistry. And the first couple of episodes, they kind of like were the saving grace. But in the last episode, it was like, okay, now it's, it's really clicking. Um, so if you've been hesitating on Osamatsu san and you watch the first two seasons, maybe for the same reasons I was hesitating on it, I would give this a shot because the third episode does give me some hope that they that they have somewhere they're going with this and that there's a reason it exists. And I do think those new characters really do add something interesting to the mix and they're really funny in their own right. So that's my thoughts on Osamatsu-san. Perfect. All right. You've convinced me. I'm going to go and watch season one and two and then we'll we'll check back in. You got me into major... So mm. uh, I know this isn't a ringing ado- endorsement like major, but no. we'll give it. I'll give it a shot. So all right, that's what we're watching this week, and that is just the beginning of what is going to be a long, chunky, meaty, big podcast. The anime. When the mother for this week's notable anime news section, or the anime news as we like to call it, saw this section, it said. Or she said one thing, <laughs> man, that's a big boy. <laughs> so um, now I want a hamburger. Is that what you think of when you think of big boy as a hamburger? No, I did. I, no, I'm just making a joke, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I do know Bob's big boy. Do people out there know Bob's big boy? I think they know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's here in Japan, you know, it's here in Japan. Oh, now you're making me hungry. All right, so we'll start off as we usually do with the Oricon rankings, but in a surprise twist, I'm going to do it this week. It's a coup! No, it's 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 more of like a, a, my c- continuing trend of copying you as much as possible, because I, I look up to you, man. 
<laughs> as well you should. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's just jump into um uh, what the one thing I'm going to add really quickly this week is the light novel section. I know you don't care about light novels, Guardian Enzo, but I think they influence anime enough to where I want to at least take a quick look at what's yeah. popular right now. Totally. Um, and surprising me because I didn't think there was a light novel for this, but Kimitsu no Yaiba's movie uh, has a novelization, and that actually took the top spot this week. You want a, a ranking with Kimitsu on top? Oh yeah, that's going to be a trend. <laughs> that's going to be a trend for sure. Okay, number two, we've got uh, Classroom of the Elite, which needs a second season. Then we've got another uh, volume of the uh, novelization of Kimitsu no Yaiba, followed by Is It Wrong to Seek a Dungeon, which I don't know what that is, but it's probably a light novel that hasn't gotten an anime yet. Uh, and then there's Kimitsu no Yaiba's light novel, which is Road, Wind Road Sign. There is The Irregular at Magic High School, which we all love so much. Um, Kimitsu no Yaiba Happy Flower, another light novel. And then Kimitsu no Yaiba at number eight <laughs> with One Winged Butterfly, uh, followed by... <laughs> This is this is the title where when I saw this I was like okay this is going too far in another world with my smartphone which I think did get an anime so the twenty second volume that is at number nine and then a different world led by the moon fifteen which I don't think we've gotten an anime for is at number ten but we won't talk about that too much and we'll jump <laughs> s- jump straight into the Kimitsu no Yaiba ranking, also known as the manga mm. weekly ranking, where Kimitsu no Yaiba took all 10 spots this week. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And so let's jump into the anime DVD, where for a change, Kimitsu no Yaiba did not take the first or the second spot. The first uh, spot is for... Sword Art Online Alicization War, which was the recent anime series. Um, second spot by Millionaire Detective. Third spot by um, Let It Go, Anna and the Snow Queen. And then number four by My Neighbor Totoro. Number five by the collection of Miyazaki, Hay- Hayao Miyazaki works. Uh, number six is Pet 2. Number seven is Paw Patrol. Um, and then number eight is uh, Yahari. Number nine is Trolls, and then number 10 is Weathering With You. So that mm. still made it into the season. And then finally, we'll cap it off with anime Blu-ray, which I saved for last. And for that, uh, Bungo 2 Alchemist actually got... Yeah, Bungo 2... Oh, wow. You would think that'd be a, a anime DVD thing. So Bungo 2 Alchemist at number one. Sword Art Online Alization at number two. Number three is Fantasy Star Online. Number four is Anna and the Snow Queen. That... that Disney thing. Uh, number five, finally, Kimitsu no Yaiba uh, limited edition. Number six is Violet Evergarden. Number seven is also Violet Evergarden, Gaiden, the, the first movie. Uh, number eight is Kimitsu no Yaiba again. And then number nine is Kimitsu no Yaiba. And then number ten is Violet Evergarden, uh, volume four. So, lots of Kimitsu no Yaiba. Any comments on all of this, Guardian Enzo? No, just happy to see Millionaire Detective ranking two and three again. I think that's awesome to see it still doing well. Yes, yes. That was that was impressive. And as we've continued to mention, and I'm sure we'll get into again and again, Kimitsu no Yaiba just dominating everything, yep. slaying everybody. Yep. All right. Let's move on to the, the first se- section of our anime news, which is the rumors. So I just wanted a quick follow-up. I know you and I were both hoping for Vinland Saga uh, season two announcement. Yeah, the talk show went and uh, came and went, and we did not get anything. Uh, they did mention in the talk show that COVID had impacted things and that they're working very hard on something, but it was just a thank you to the fans for supporting it, and we'll hear back more, I guess. Yeah, and I want to say also that if you watch the the, the broadcast of it, uh, Yabuta Sensei, Troll Sensei, does do an English message at the end, um, and it's pretty good English, I have to say. Uh, and he sometimes writes in English too, so it's clear he has a good command of it. Um, but he, in that message, he specifically says in English, you know, we can't. He says, and I quote, "We can't say anything officially right now." Which, if you read between the tea leaves you know, read the tea leaves sounds pretty promising actually. 
Uh, and then he says, you know, you know, we, there have been some delays, and I'm I took that to mean COVID nineteen, but it could be anything with wit. But we really, it, it, he made it clear. Let's put it this way: they this is something they really want to do. Uh, the plans are are still going forward at this point. Uh, it, it's hard to come away from it not thinking that there would be an announcement at some point in the future. It's just disappointing that it didn't happen here because this is kind of where you would expect it to happen. So the fact that it didn't is a little bit of a letdown. Yeah, that man is such a tease. I'm just going to nickname him the tease from now on. Okay. Yeah, but he speaks English well. The English tease. The English tease. Let's get into series announcements. Mm. And speaking of big boys, this is our big boy story for the week. Um, I think, and there'll be another big one, but in, in the serious news, uh, announcements, this is big for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And this is from Kyle Cardine over at Crunchyroll. And he talks about Netflix revealing and up uh, the upcoming slate of anime titles for 2021. And they announced a total of how many was it? 12 series, 16, 16 series. Um, and I'll quickly go over them, and then if we want to highlight any specific ones, we can talk about them. But I don't think we want to go through and talk about all 16 series in detail. No. So no. the first one was Baki Hanma, which is a sequel to the Baki thing that's currently going on. B, the beginning, got a sequel called Succession that was announced. Um, then we got Eden, um, which is a human girl and a robot thing. Um, this will be in May 2021. Uh, Godzilla Singular Point, which we talked about already, that got mm. a trailer. Um, High Rise Innovation um, also got announced. Mm. Uh, and then Pacific Rim The Black, uh, which is an anime on the English movie franchise mm. by Polygon Pictures. Resident Evil Infinite Darkness, which we talked about, which I don't even think is an anime, but, you know. Mm. Yes. Uh, Rilakuma's Rilaka Theme Park Adventure. Uh, which is a weird teddy bear thing. That's probably going to be like a stop motion thing. Uh, and then Spriggan, which we talked about very briefly when we were talking about a, all the way in episode two, I believe. Um, so that's getting a CGI. CGI. Adaptation. CGI. Yep. yep. Um, and then the one that I think uh, both you and I are probably pretty excited about the way of the house husband, which is a JC staff series. Yeah, that's that's my pick among this list, just for the record. And then Thermai Rome Nove, which is, mm. uh, I believe, the Roman bathhouse uh, manga that's being right. adapted. Uh, it's a comedy series. So yes, um, and then Thus Spoke Kishibe Rohan. It's a spinoff of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, and that's coming out in 2021 as well. And then... Is this really anime? Maybe it is. Transformers War for Cybertron Trilogy is mm. also coming out. Um, Tress Trees. I don't know how you say that. That's also coming out next year. Um, and then Vampire in the Garden, which is a Wit Studio production, which is why it's notable. And then the final one. Yes, 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 it is the final one. Yasuke, which mm. is uh, being headed by MAPPA. And that is also releasing next year. And it's about an African samurai. And and I think Nobunaga Oda is Oda Nobunaga is also. Well, uh, yeah. 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 All right. So that's all the series. Anything in particular stand out to you in this deluge of things? And then we can talk about yeah. Netflix as a whole. Okay. So uh, as a massive dump of 16 series, I have to say collectively for my personal interest, I find it a mildly disappointing list. There's not a ton in here that really interests me a lot. Uh, the Way of the House Husband is my top pick among this particular group. It's a pretty interesting manga. Uh, Thermo Romai, the, there was a Thermo Romai anime a few years ago. I don't know if you remember. It was a short, about five minutes. Yes. And it was yes. stop motion. Or not stop motion, but some kind of weird, cheap, you know, CGI kind of thing. And it was really fun, though. It, it, it's a really fun, smart series, Thermo Romai, actually. Uh, and I'm, I don't know whether this one is going to be a short or whether it's going to get conventionally animated or what, but I'm interested in seeing where it goes with this. Yasuke is interesting. Uh, it's because it's directed by LaShawn Thomas, who's a, a, who's an American who's done some quote unquote anime work before anime ish. And Yasuke, of course, is a real person. He was one of Nobunaga's bodyguards. He was, he was, uh, he was of African descent, which certainly made him an unusual figure in Japanese court at that time. Um, so that's an interesting theme. 
Uh, I have to say, honestly, I have not been thrilled with LaShawn Thomas's work up to now. I haven't found it to be particularly compelling, but it'll be interesting to see what he does with this. The one other point I want to make about this list is I think what we're seeing is which I think is a, not a lot enough people are talking about it because I think it's a, an important development for a number of reasons, is Netflix is trying to loosen the term anime. They're trying to loosen the definition and call some things anime that I don't think are anime. And uh, I think they're trying to do this for marketing reasons because they're trying to, to make anime as much of a sexy uh, as much of a sexy marketing label as they can. And so they're kind of loosening the definition of what we call anime, uh, which I don't particularly think is a healthy development, actually. Uh, so I think that's something to keep an eye on because Netflix is trying to um, trying to be a uh, trying to be a, a level setter here, trying to move the goalposts a little bit, and they're powerful enough that they may be able to do it. Uh, so I think it's an interesting development that not enough people are talking about. No, they've been doing it for a while. They did it with the Castlevania anime, which was completely done in the u.s especially season two which had a texas animation studio doing it so some of that stuff i i i've been seeing it for a while and i think it it's because of what you're saying anime is a powerful marketing term and i i don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing i know uh people used to have these debates about is it anime with avatar and stuff like that and i think no definitively we we both think no but um, if if it gives us quality animation, I'm not opposed to the idea of other things being called anime because anime is just J- Japan's shortened form of a- animation, which is a it's called anime, and they that's just animation or how they say it, animation um, shortened down. So yeah, I I, I it, it'll be interesting because we could do a whole topic on this. But what's what's interesting to me is the fact that Netflix just dumped sixteen series out of nowhere, and they committed to all these series for next year, which which I think is healthy. A lot of these are manga adaptations or their original works, and I think it, from that perspective, I agree with you. There's not a ton to be excited about, though. I am excited for Spriggan. I'm excited for house husband i'm excited for the the samurai one that we talked about and even the the one by wit studio just because of how great um uh great pretender was and it's Mm. another wit studio original series so i'll give them the benefit of the doubt there and i have heard high rise invasion is not a bad manga actually just for the record although i haven't read it right so i think that's 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 exciting enough is this the amazing list that i was hoping for where we've got like banger after banger no i agree that's no. that's totally true. The one thing that I found interesting is uh, the Ultraman sequel that they had promised for this year was nowhere to be fe- seen. So I wonder what's happening with that. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the thing is that, you know, Netflix, Netflix has plenty of money to fund as many anime series as they want. That's not the issue. The issue is production capacity. Um, yeah. And that may be another reason why they're calling things anime that aren't really anime because they they may have an idea that more and more they're going to have to directly source not outsource but directly source animation studios outside of Japan to produce they we may even be close to the point where 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 Netflix is going to pick a manga that they want to see adapted and they're going to give it to an American studio or whatever and just still call it an anime um and again i feel this is a bit of a slippery slope which is why it worries me I don't think it's a bad thing to have anime. As you say, literally, it is a shorthand for animation. But I don't think it's a bad thing to have anime that is Japanese have a distinct label to it. I I, th- I don't I think that's not a bad thing. I don't think it detracts either from anime or from non-anime. I think it just simply singles out something that's unique and and special. Now we get into a gray area here because a lot of anime, which I think most people would never hesitate to call anime are outsourced, a lot of episodes are outsourced, and a lot of parts of episodes are outsourced to Korea or China. Yes. Uh, So when do we get to the point where we start saying, well, maybe that's not anime? And I think that's a valid valid counterpoint, too. So I I don't really know where that line is. I just know Netflix is trying to blur it. Yeah, and and I think for me personally, the thing that I want to stay in Japan is the writing. Because I think the writing and the skill of storytelling... That is something that I will 
unequivocally say right now my favorite storytellers and my favorite writers of the modern era are Japanese people. They they yeah. are just good at this and they do it at, with a level of thoughtfulness and they pick a variety of topics that I don't think Western uh, media or even European media or wherever. There, I'm sure there's some works that we don't know about that are kind of hiding in the fringes but right. like really popular stuff in the west is all very similar tropey mm. um it, it fits into specific genres so that's the part that i don't want to lose I, and the thing i will say on that is that there's a huge there's a huge comics culture in france actually france is the second biggest comics culture in the world after after japan but the only thing we've really, I mean, we've seen bits and pieces over the years, but the only thing that's really come over in the form of like a traditional manga style French comic getting an anime adaptation is Radiant. Yes. Um, which was fine. I like Radiant. I didn't love it. But the fact is there are there are better French manga, whatever you want to call them, uh, than, than Radiant that could easily get anime adaptations. Uh, and I'm hoping we're going to see more of that in the future, actually, uh, although there's no sign of any floodgates opening yet. But that's a big that's a big pool of potential material for anime there that that I hope they go back to more because there's a lot. I mean, Radiant is a good series, but there's better stuff in France that they could be adapting. And I hope they adapt some of it. If it ever comes to pass, I'm totally going to call it Franime. Actually, the, the, just for the record, because you know we have Manhua uh, and Manhua, yeah. they call it uh, Manfra is what they're Manfra. calling it. Yeah, it, French manga, oh, French comics. Yeah, I, yeah. So I don't yeah. like that. That reminds me of a right. man with an afro. <laughs> okay, well there you go. Maybe Yasuke then. Uh, but um, uh, anyway, so Netflix, boy, they're a big topic. Yeah, yeah, and we'll continue to talk about it. So let's move on to a bunch of smaller, uh, quick hits that I'll just kind of mention. Um, and then there is one I want your comment on. Sure. But uh, Viz announced that uh, Jojo Golden Wind Manga is coming in summer 2021, which I was like, about time. The anime aired a while ago. So it just goes to show that the manga licensors in the US and the, the Western side of the world are a bit slow on the uptake there. Um, Kaguya-sama, Love is War, Season 3 announced. I know you're not a big fan, but I'm excited about that. So quick note there. And then the two series that I do want to talk about. First, let's go with Gohan's animating Clamp's new Tokyo Babylon mm. in 2021. Any opinions on that? Have you read Tokyo Babylon? Uh, no. I know the characters a little bit. Like, there's uh, everything with Clamp is about crossovers, as you know. Right. These days. I know well, all days for Clamp, really, but I know that like Subaru from the Subasa Reservoir Chronicles. Uh, so I, I know, um, actually, generally a pretty well regarded Clamp series, Tokyo Babylon. Yeah. There was an anime, like an OVA, I think, long ago with Takahiro Sakurai, not Takahiro Sakurai, uh, Tomokazu Sugita playing the lead character. That's how old it was, although he still plays teenagers, so who knows? Um, potentially could be interesting. You know, Gohan's is not a studio you go out of your way to say, oh, my God, you know, quality, quality, quality. But um, it could be interesting. Uh, you know, it's it's a character driven action series with people from both genders, which alone makes it more interesting than most new series announcement in in 2021. So, yeah, potentially could be interesting. Yeah. The Gohan's thing was what everybody was crying about on Twitter, yeah. uh, especially the fans of the manga. So. That happens all the time if you're not freaking, I don't know, uh, Studio Wit or even Mappa or something like that. Most people are sad or Madhouse or Production ID. Although I will say Gohans has given people a couple of specific reasons to particularly be. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you do handshakers... I mean, you're going to, people are going to react. I mean, that's, that's just reality. No, there are no other studios that can put something as egregious as handshakers yeah. on their resume. So that's, that's to be fair. Handshakers, the anime that you want to shake your fist at. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe they've grown. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. We'll, we'll see in 2021. I, I want to see a good clamp series cause I don't think I've seen one in a while. So it's been a I'll give it time. a, I'll give it a look. Yeah. All right, the other one, because I think you like this series about as much, probably more than me, Denokol's director Mitsuo Isol 
is mm. making a new film in spring 2022. And I believe it's called Extraterrestrial Girls, uh, Boys and Girls. Um, so any comments on this? Are you excited? I know we both like Denicoil quite a bit. And this this has been a long time coming from what I have heard. Yes. Um, well, I'm excited because I do, I do love uh, Amazo Ito. Um, and, uh, I think, I, well, I love especially Deno Coil, but I feel very much the same as I, as I felt with, uh, as I felt with, uh, Akane Kazuki coming out with Hoshi Aino Sora. Uh, it's like, I really excited about it because this was a guy who did some great work and, and then sort of disappeared. And, you know, that's, that's the, the problem is this was announced in 2018 now they're saying it's going to come out in 2022. Um, and the other thing is it's coming out with a new studio. Uh, and there, if you go to the website for the anime, the website has a big message that's saying, uh, uh, you know, recruiting anime staff. Uh, so, and after what happened to Akane Kazuki with Hoshi Aisu no Sora, which was a story that we talked about, you know, and, and that, um, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I, 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 it's not going to shock me if this never happens. Let's put it this way. Uh, and there was also talk that this was going to be, uh, that there was, a, this was going to be a series and then it turned into, no, it's going to be a movie. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I hope it happens. Uh, you know, if it does happen, I'll be the first in line to to review it and talk about it. But I'm not super duper confident that it is going to happen. I just have a feeling that that he's not going to be able to get funding and it's going to fall through. Well, uh, according to the news story here, which is over at Crunchyroll and by Mika Hazu Komatsu, um, they formed a new studio, as you mentioned, Production Plus H, and they already have investments from Avex Pictures, Asmic Ace, and a few others, and that production has already begun. Plus, they've released a teaser visual, which is drawn by the Eureka 7 character designer, mm. Kenichi Yoshida. So I right. think there's some hope there. Wouldn't you agree? There's hope, but the problem is... There was hope with Akane Kazuki and Hoshi Aino Sora too, and look what happened with that. I just think it's hard for it's hard for people to who you know who are going to uh, who are trying to do anime that aren't commercially cookie cutter these days to get funding. Now he's like Kazuki if he calls and says because Hoshi I had a, a great staff because of people the, the respect this guy commands, and it's the same. You know, with Esau, he 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 commands great respect. He can get people like Yoshida Kenichi, the character designer. He can get people like that to work on this. The problem is going to be the money. And um, I also just want to point out for the record, other than that Crunchyroll story, I have not seen this referred to as a movie anywhere. Um, I, I don't think it's established that this is going to be a movie. I think there's a, a, I think the original plan, at least I know was that this was going to be a series. And I don't, like I say, maybe they're right, but I personally have not seen, I have not seen it mentioned anywhere else that this was now a movie other than the Crunchyroll story. So I don't, I'm not confident in what the truth of that is. Let's put it that way. All right. All right. Well, yeah. we'll, we'll keep an eye out. Yep. I think we're both excited for this for a lot of the reasons you mentioned yeah. and I mentioned. So we'll keep an eye out. Okay. Since you mentioned Crunchyroll um, and since we referenced some news stories from them, this is the other big boy story of the yeah. week. And this is yep. the fact that, and you were the one who actually put this in the docket and then I kind of adjusted a little bit. So I'm going to do it two ways. I'm going to read a bit of the story from The Verge. And then I also want to, uh, mentioned this Twitter post by somebody that Jake, our friend Jake, uh, mm. retweeted. So we'll we'll use that as talking points because I think he brings up some interesting ideas. Um, so the story over at The Verge written by James Vincent, Sony is reportedly close to buying Crunchyroll for nearly $1 billion. Uh, their source for this is Nikkei Asia, 
Nikkei Asia. Um, and Nikkei is basically saying that Sony first negotiated exclusive rights to bid for the streaming service and um, that the streaming service has hit 3 million paying subscribers this year. And now they're in the final negotiations. Uh, they do say that an asking price is unclear, although uh, Nikkei is saying that Sony could end up spending more than 100 billion yen, which is around 957 million. So pretty close to a billion. And, and then there's just some background stuff on there. But the tweet that I was talking about, which is from, uh, is it loads? Justin Savakis. And this yeah. is this this guy. He's a, a he's a pro uh, video anime nerd, but he's also the owner of a video post production company, Media OCD. He's very connected. He's very connected. He 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 knows his stuff. Yes, and so he uh, quickly summarized, you know, plus points and negative points about this. So the plus point number one, likely to combine Crunchyroll and Funimation now. Um, the second plus point, likely to lower license fees. Uh, and then the third one is may improve technicals, which is, I think, the big one for me. Mm, mm. Uh, but then the negatives, which are big negatives, definite layoffs and streamlining. Yep. Many licensors will hate it. Look for alternatives for overseas distribution. And then co-op deals with Sentai, who have been killing it with, you know, re- re-releasing. Um, uh, what was the big series they recently released? Oh, they really well. Seiray no Morbido, and, and yeah, yeah. I mean, they 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 do a great job. Yeah. So those deals will uh, likely not survive with this purchase. So, uh, what are your thoughts on this whole thing and what it might mean for anime fans, particularly in the West and uh, anywhere outside of Japan? Really. Well, first of all, I want to say um, it would be hard to find a better use of Twitter than Justin's. Justin's tweet it's to because he basically took what's a really complicated story and he gave a very insightful insider perspective an opinion yes but an insider perspective on what he thinks will happen in 280 characters um yes. and so it's a phenomenal use of the of the media uh, medium of twitter so Justin Savakis kudos to you first of all that's that's like tweet of the year for me um Second, kudos to you for finding that tweet and 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 incorporating it. And third, fuck if I know whether I feel good about this or not. I, I my my temperamentally consolidation always makes me nervous, but on the because consolidation generally means less consideration of the needs of the consumer, just as a broad general rule. On the other hand, consolidation of funny and crunchy roll is probably not a bad thing in in a lot of respects from a fan perspective, many of which Justin lays out in his tweet. Um uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm, you know, this is a uh, the licensor issue is a big concern. The licensor issue is a big concern. Yes. And this I mean, I think a lot of this could end up being I think a lot of lower hanging fruit on the anime tree may not survive this. Uh, and this may drive some companies out of business. Uh, and so he talks about layoffs and streamlining. That's one thing I think this may drive some people out of business altogether. And that could be, again, we could be heading towards a general direction of less choice, which worries me. Yeah. The choice angle. And then the fact that I think Sony actually owns, I believe they own, a1 Pictures and Clover Studio Works. So, what happens to all the Crunchyroll original projects like Doctor Stone and Shield Hero and Promise Neverland and all these things? That is also worrying to me because will the production committees will they devolve? What will happen with that? Funimation also has funded some anime as separate entities. Do they when that consolidation happens? What happens to all of that? Um, is interesting. Uh, from a technology perspective, I think this needs to happen because let's be honest, Netflix is eating Crunchyroll's lunch. Even though you know they're healthy at three billion subscribers or whatever, I think the quality of anime coming from Netflix and the big gets that they've been getting uh, with Great Pretender and stuff like that, it, it's clear that they have the money and they have the heft for it. And Sony 
putting them under their umbrella. Might that be a bad thing, especially uh, with the PlayStation coming out, the new PlayStation and Sony uh, might take another crack at their content media strategy. Because right now, the only thing keeping Sony profitable and afloat and their big seller is their video game division. Their movies and all that other stuff is not doing very well. I mean, they've got that partnership with Marvel uh, uh, regarding Spider-Man. But I think this is something that both Sony needs and Crunchyroll and Funimation need. Uh, but yes, I, I am concerned about the the competition angle of it. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it, I, I always worry that any time that we're relying on giving corporations more, giving multinationals more power and then hoping they'll do the right thing. <laughs> yes. And yes. that worry, that scares me. That scares me. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, consolidation is just happening in the industry, as we've noted. So I think this is just a pattern with uh, TV networks also buying studios and stuff like right. that. So we'll we'll see how it uh, shakes out. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yep. Moving on to Jujutsu no Kaisen, which also got a big bump uh, this week. And this is over at Anime News Network. And it is by... Oh, I was hoping for uh, Raphael. Raphael's just gone now. Yeah. Igen Lu. He's on hiatus. Yeah, yeah. Taking a break after kind of running Anime News Network by himself for so many years. <laughs> All right. So Jujutsu no Kaisen manga tops 10 million in circulation, uh, which is a 400% increase from 2.5 million before the anime was announced last November. Any comments on this? What do you think? Only just to point out, as we mentioned on the podcast before, Jujutsu Kaisen is the next big hit. Uh, it's, you know, to 400% bump in one year in volume circulation is is pretty tremendous. It's not Kimetsu, but if, the, if Kimetsu had never happened, people would be talking about, oh my God, Jujutsu is a huge hit. It's, it's only because Kimetsu was such an, an unearthly hit that it doesn't get as much attention because this is a very impressive explosion in popularity for this franchise. So there you go. It's just tremendous. And it, this is by any non Kimetsu measure you could apply to it, a very big, very big success story. Yes. And if, if it hits uh, uh, Kimetsu numbers, maybe I'll stop calling it Jujutsu no Kaisen because I keep adding the no in there for some reason. But yeah, I've, uh, it's interesting. And like I said, I think a week or two ago, this is the power of anime. So yeah, the anime push helped it out quite a bit. As I suspect, it helped with Kimitsu no Yaiba, which brings us to our <laughs> final story of the week. Uh, Kimitsu no Yaiba is on the cover of Seventeen, which is a Japanese teen magazine i believe no this is the american magazine 17 this is that's why oh. i that's why i put the story in there because i thought it was really funny this is the american magazine 17 the teen girl magazine yeah i, yeah. I don't read teen girl magazine so uh, i manage the bookstores so i manage bookstores so i i you know i just it's i know about these things and this has been a this is i don't know how long this magazine's been in print 30 years 40 years it's it, it is as you say it's 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 like uh What's that other one? Something Bop is or, or Shoujo. There's some other something. There's a couple of magazines that focus heavily on teenage girls, and this is one of them. So okay, you're not secretly a Seventeen fan. No, no, but I think it's pretty wild that Kimetsu was on the cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's amazing. All right, that kind of wraps up our news for the week. We had another chunky big boy episode uh, with regards to the news and. This is uh, a section that we enjoy looking into. And the big story is this week, Netflix dropped 17 big, uh, 16 big ones. And then Sony might drop a billion big ones for yep. the Crunchyroll. All right. Let's move on to the big, deep, chunky part of the podcast. And I'm just going to keep saying chunky as much as I can this week. Come in. So we've been talking a lot about thick and chunky things, <laughs> which I think segues beautifully into the topic that I want to talk about this week, which is something I've been thinking about for a while recently, and that's fan service in anime and manga. Uh, so let's start off with the big thing. What do I mean when I say fan service? I don't mean 
uh, throwing a bone to the fans or giving them something exciting. I I mean the etchy stuff, the 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 cleavage, the shower scenes, all that stuff. The the hand on the boob, that anime is it's a trope, you know, the the main character or the protagonist in harm anyway will accidentally fall and do something really mm. skeevy. So what is your definition of fan service garden and so we'll start with that and then we'll move on from there. Uh you know, etchy. It's uh it's you know, the reason etchy is called etchy is because it's the H from hentai. And uh, we talked about this. It's it's like it's so it's not hentai. It's just a little piece of hentai, and that's what etchy is. And that to me is basically what fan service is. I think the two broadly, the two types of fan service are fan service that's overtly played for comedy, and fan service that's just there to titillate. But I think they're both fan service, at least in my definition of the term. Yeah, and I think I agree with you. But the 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 reason that I wanted to define this is because there's some series that come up against this definition and then start to uncomfortably rub up against it. Uh, no, no pun intended. <laughs> no bad analogy intended. Uh, stuff like prison school, stuff like what was the, the, the really crass show um, where they, they're not allowed to swear at all. Oh God, I don't remember that. I saw like two episodes and dropped it, but I do remember. Yeah, that, you yeah. dropped it, right? It gets so terribly raunchy. Mm. Um, it it just becomes softcore porn. Do you remember when point. her when her flag breaks? Do you remember that show? Uh, no. Oh yeah, that. Was what was the issue. Japanese title? Uh, I'll tell you. You keep talking. I'll find the Japanese title. Yeah, yeah. So stuff like that is where I I feel like it it's fan service, but it's fan service to a grotesque degree or something like queen's blade or uh, ikitosin the series that are just primarily there to titillate and they've got action and stuff like that so those i would almost say aren't fan service they're they're like you said they're almost like two more towards the hentai side of things but the question is do we want to talk about those specifically or do we not it, or do we just disregard them as you know they're their own kind of thing in the corner and we don't we don't want to discuss that because a fan service focus show it's telling you what it is on the tin right. at that point right by the way the name of the show I was talking about was Kanojo ga flagwa orare tara and uh it was about a, a a kid who goes to a boarding school and Basically, he literally could like see the different flags, like the romance flag and the death flag. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember this. And I actually thought that show was kind of funny. It was. And, it was. and kind of dark, too, actually. If, because you remember how if I, if I said Brunhilde was like a comedy dressed up as 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 a tragedy. I think that uh, when her if her flag breaks, actually not when, but if her flag breaks, is kind of a tragedy dressed up as a comedy. Uh, and I think this was a show that people kind of dismissed as as being because of the fan service, possibly dismissed overtly as being something shallow and stupid when it really was actually kind of smart. Uh, but that being said, I don't personally want to talk about uh, I don't personally want to talk about these overtly fan service shows because. Frankly, I just don't think the topic is that interesting. And I think it's, as you say, they're very clear about what they are. There's there's not a lot of nuance to it. They're there to be kind of softcore porn, to be titillating. Uh, and that's fine. It's the, it's the, that's your thing. If, if, the, if, that's your, if you find one that meets your, it hits you in your fetish speech, sweet spot, whatever. But I don't think it requires a whole lot of analysis, honestly. Yeah, I agree with you. And the reason I wanted to bring that up up front is because I want to talk about fan service when it's kind of integrated. It's not the focus of the anime or the manga or the story, but it's there to kind of either supplement it or... Mm used as a narrative device and stuff like that. And I want to ask a really big question to start off this discussion. Is fan service in any form a good thing? Is it ever good? Can it be okay in certain scenarios? Or does it always detract? And I'll let you go first and then I'll give my two cents on it. Yes, it can be good. Um, and it depends on the context. Um, and I'll give you a perfect example for me is R15, uh, which a lot of people, again, which I think the same thing with it for flag breaks, a lot of people dismiss that as in a very book by its cover kind of a thing. 
Uh, and um, but it's better than if her flag breaks for sure. But I, I think it got dismissed for a lot of the same reasons. And that and the fact that the animation is kind of low rent. But I really loved R15 because but the in the context of what we're talking about, I think it, it's a show where the fan service was in a it was integral to the plot uh, and B it was integral to a plot that actually was asking some kind of interesting questions. And the whole, the whole central theme of R15, which people didn't bother to, to, to worry about because they just dismissed as being stupid is the main character is a 15 year old boy who is, has a secret life as a, as a, as an, as a hentai uh, novelist and not etchy hentai novelist. And, but his whole, his whole the secret to his success, although even he doesn't realize it, is he's writing sex scenes from the perspective of a, a, an idealistic fifteen year old who has no idea what either sex or romance really is. He only knows what he's read on the internet, right, or what he fantasizes about. So this is the secret to his appeal as a, as as an as a hentai writer. And over the course of the story, he actually begins to understand through interactions with a couple of different girls. There's, it's a bit of a harem, but there's really two girls that are basically, it's more of a triangle than a harem. But um, there's a girl he's absolutely in love with, and then a girl who's absolutely in love with him. And so the, he learns about the real world of sex and love and how it contrasts with the fantasy that a not only he cooked up in his mind as 14 15 year old boys will do but turned into a lucrative uh, endeavor as a, as a, as a as a novelist right so and the way these two worlds come in conflict with each other so it's it a it's a really good series that that deserved to be uh, that deserved to be watched from a perspective of what it was not people thought it was but b it's a series that used fan service integrally in the service of a plot that actually is interesting and asks interesting questions. Yeah. So I've, I've seen both of the series that you've mentioned. I never finished R15, but I don't remember why it wasn't because I didn't, I think it was because of the fan service actually. So that brings me to my point where I think, I don't think fan service is good in most scenarios. I think it distracts and detracts from the plot. And, and I feel this way about just, fan service, nudity, titillation in general. I think the reason even you liked R15 and the other show, the one with the death flags, which I remember the reason I enjoyed that series so much is because he got those two choices. Neither of these two choices were great. And then he had to pick one. He wasn't allowed to not pick one. And so that was where a lot of the story came from. But I would argue, uh, and, and I'm curious to hear what you think about this, I feel like both stories could have worked without the sexualization and the fan service as it were in there because you could imply and depict some of that stuff without having to like for what's his name? Uh, the main character of R15, he has these fantasies and then the, the fan service in the anime is those fantasies actually playing out before your eyes, right? I feel like you could verbalize that, you could imply that without actually showing a lot of that stuff. And I think the story would have been almost better because for what you said, a lot of people dropped it because right. of the fan service. Right. I feel like more people would have enjoyed it. And it's the same problem with Shokugeki no Soma. Those original first two episodes are so crass. And I remember my friend... Uh, who I've mentioned a few times on this podcast, he he likes a lot of anime and he watches a lot of stuff and that was just too much for him. Mm. And he never ended up going and watching the first season, which your opinions on Shokugeki as a whole uh, aside, the first season is really good. Mm, I agree. And I think fan service has the potential to piss off more people than it rewards. So that that's my thought on it. Do you think that mm. maybe without fan service, those shows would have been better? I think you could easily have done if her flag breaks without much, and it didn't have as much as R15, but I, I, I think you could have done without most of it, and I don't think it would have materially detracted from telling the story. I personally think Taketo, by the way, is the main character of uh, R15. Uh, yep. I don't think you could, personally, I don't think you could have told R15 as a story without the fan service. I just think don't think it would have been the same series. I think you would have had to tell a different story. Maybe you could have told a story that was just as interesting, but it would have been a different story. Uh, so no, I, I I don't agree in that case. I I I think I would agree with you that in most cases, 
fan service is a more of a detraction distraction than it is anything else because it's forced in most cases. It's it's transparently there just to be crass, you know, and I think that Chokugeki is a good example of that. I don't think that's the case with R15 though. Just my personal opinion, I don't think it would have been R15 without it because I think that was really almost the whole theme of the story. So, um I just it doesn't bother me. I think I think it's clear to our listeners at this point. Uh, and I don't, I'm, you can disagree with me, feel free. I think as a broad generalization, I'm less bothered by fan service nudity than you are. I think that's probably a fair statement. Yes. Uh, and I think our discussion of major illustrates that to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that being said, I agree with you that in most cases it is a distraction rather than a, rather than a supporting pillar. I just think R15 is one of those rare exceptions. Yeah, so that that leads me to my next big question. I think it's one that I'm curious about and have been thinking about, but I also want to ask you, why do you think it's still shoved in there regardless? Um, Because they think it, at least in the old days, I think it was because it helped to sell discs. Um, and I think that it still helps to sell discs in some cases because I think there's a lot of stuff and this, some of it verges over into that first category that we decided not to talk about. But there's a lot of cases where people buy the Blu-ray versions of stuff because it's edited in the TV version. Um, so I think in some cases, it frankly, it still helps sell discs. Yeah, and I think it also feeds into the waifu, best girl part of the culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. Yeah. I mean, this is a culture where millions of hug pillows are sold every year in Akihabara, and uh, Akihabara and Denden Town, you know. So this is a big part of anime's audience. We shouldn't pretend it's not the case. Yeah, hug pillows, the the figures, which, you know, even anime that don't have fan service in the actual anime, there's like really, really risque figures and hentai figures almost. Not to mention, not to mention the whole dojinchi culture, which is by no means all R18, but a lot of it is. Yes, the popular stuff for sure. There's a lot of popular stuff that's uh, just pornographic versions. And I I have less of a problem with dojinchi being pornographic because, you know, it, there's a market for that stuff. And there's if fans want to kind of indulge in that kind of fantasy stuff on their own time in their own little corner, that I think is less egregious to me than if it's if it's actively tonally like right. shifting the story. No, I agree. Like I that. agree. It's a different category. It's a different category. Yeah. And I think uh, a big part of a lot of this stuff, uh, it, it goes down to financial stuff, but I do wonder if it's also targeting a very specific dem- demographic in Japan uh, that we've both talked about is shrinking and shrinking. Hmm. Shrinkage. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's shrinking. I don't know if it's shrinking. That's the thing. Yeah. And I think for me, it was really interesting. I, I think I'm a big to our Magistral Index fan. And I remember and a fairy tale fan. And I remember a couple of years ago when those both of those series were airing at their specific times, I wanted to get a Toma or a Natsu figure because mm. I like those characters. Mm. And at the time, I couldn't find any. It was all just the girls in the in the in the shows that had figures for them. And that was, I think, an eye opening time for me, where I realized that maybe some of this stuff is just, you know, it's it's. I mean, let's be honest, sex sells, right? Yeah, sex so sells. So I think yeah. that's yeah, yeah, that's that's what it is. That's what fan service is. And the only shows you're going to see figures and stuff on the guys is shows that where a lot of the audience it's it's targeted for at women. It's only logical, yeah. right? I mean, I got to admit that one of the reasons I liked Fairy Tale, and I've said this to you before on our podcast, is I, I thought Lucy was, I like Lucy as a character altogether, but I thought Lucy is just an incredibly attractive, I mean, I liked looking at Lucy every week. I think Lucy was beautiful, just a beautiful character design, really sexy, you know, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, maybe it's objectifying her in that sense, and I apologize for that, but I mean, I admit it. I thought Lucy was really, really sexy, and I thought I liked I liked that aspect of fairy tale. Uh, if it was a better show that I was like totally involved in from a story standpoint, maybe that would have been a distraction. But in that case, it was like one of the draws. It's like okay, well, Lucy's really hot, you know. And uh, what's the little cat's name? I've already forgotten him now. Even though Happy, he's, Happy's really cute, uh, you know. And I liked all the you know, the guy characters were fine, and it was so it was okay. 
But, you know, that was a show that I was never like deeply into. It was more just like a casual relationship kind of thing for me. Yeah, for me, I've never found an anime character sexy. And I think some of that has to do with how overtly the sexiness is kind of thrown in my face sometimes. Sure. And I, I and I kind of want to almost compare fan service because it is kind of playful, kind of teasy, I think, in anime versus like something like Western media. Let's look at like Game of Thrones mm. or if recently you've seen Amazon's The Boys where it's it's almost like dirty and more like overt and it's kind of part of the world building and trying to show how uh debased some of this stuff is and how society is and that kind of thing it creates a vibe what do you think about like western culture and how it compares to anime and how those two kind of are very different in how they approach fan service nudity and that kind of stuff well i mean you know game of thrones could be its own podcast and just this part of game of thrones could be its own podcast because Game of Thrones, there is to a certain extent, and, and I think that Martin strikes a much better balance in the books of 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 using violence against women to to set up, especially against women, to set up just how brutal this world is and how much of a struggle it is for the strong women in this world to fight that. Whereas I frankly think the HBO series was just rape obsessed. Uh, and I think it got to the point where it almost became unintentional self parody. They were, they were so obsessed with it. And there's, believe me, if you have read the books, you know, there's nowhere near this much rapiness in the books. It's just something that did many often Weiss for some reason decided we have to have a rape scene in every episode. And it got to the point where I just found it to be frankly offensive. Um, it's like, it's no longer being used in the service of showing, uh, how brutal this world is. It's just now there because the, the authors think it's hot or whatever. I don't know. But um, the books aren't like that. But it is necessary in that context to show uh, to show some of this because y- you're trying to set up the world, right? It's like you can't do a war movie without showing people getting killed on the battlefield. Um, and uh, the boys I can't speak specifically to because I haven't seen it. I People tell me it's great and I, I will probably get to it at some point. Yes. But... Um, it's, you know, the nudity in the newspapers like The Sun and all that, that's a kind of a separate just butt-ass stupid nonsense to sell papers. I, I don't even think that's even worthy of of, of discussion. Uh, that's not even, I mean, that's not even fan service. That's just like just flat out crass commercialistic exploitation. Um, but, you know, even something like The Sopranos or something like that, yeah, there's there's yeah. some sex scenes in there. Uh, yep. And, and... I think it. I think again. I don't want to compare the Sopranos in R15, which Lord knows the the mail would start coming <laughs> in. But to a certain extent, you see sex being used as part of the story because sex is part of life, and you have a story trying to show a more comprehensive life experience, uh, all aspects of it. And and as long as it's something that's aimed towards adults in the way that something like Game of Thrones and The Sopranos clearly are, I don't have a problem with it. You know. Hmm. Yeah, I think you brought up a really interesting point where I'll give anime a little bit of credit here. Western media is a lot more rape obsessed, I think, in its depictions of uh, violence and sex and all that right. stuff. It's it's definitely more there, and I've noticed it a lot more. And spoiler alert, The Boys goes farther than a Game of Thrones does both in terms of graphicness but then also in terms of some of the theming and stuff like that Mm. so um that part i appreciate about anime in fact i don't think there's too many stories uh, at least in the popular zeitgeist where rape is even used as a narrative device well i can think of one very prominent recent exception to that which is goblin slayer um but uh, yeah, and I, I and I think we both don't like that show very much. But I think one of the reasons Goblin Slayer proved to be as controversial as it did is because this sort of thing is not as common in anime right. as it is outside it. So I think that almost that that's almost the exception that proves the rule, if you will. Yeah, I agree. And I have never been more sick than that first episode of Goblin Slayer, which um, promoted rape and child killing in the same and episode. slavery just, too let's point out yes yeah, yeah so yeah there are some crass things uh in anime as well but on the whole i think 
we can we can agree that there's less of that there but then there's i don't think i think it's almost kind of unique how much titillation anime uses because that's not at all all that common nowadays i know in like old school horror movies in in the west we used to get a lot of that but would you agree that we don't get that kind of wink wink nudge nudge titillation that in other media than we do in anime these days in manga yeah, I think I think not even horror movies. Well, yes, horror movies, but also like it was a comedy style too that was very popular in Hollywood 30, 25, 30, 40 years ago where these kind of wink wink I would call them etchy comedies in the in the anime sense where you get sex used yep. in that kind of way and that really isn't the case so much now. Uh so yeah, I do think so. I do think that's true. Uh, and I think it's interesting to compare how animes Etchy has evolved. Uh, and this is, I know, a topic we were going to talk about anyway, but if you don't mind segueing into it, I think this is the perfect time to do it. Jump right in. Uh, because, you know, if you look at anime from the 90s and the 80s, you know, fan service was even more, perhaps even more common in anime then than it is now, but it was also, I think, more humorous as a rule than it is now. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree. I think the the there's two types, right? There was the early uh fan service in the harem anime and stuff like that and then right. there was the the more western which we still see today the the more rapey stuff in like Nin- ninja scroll and ghost in the shell and all that stuff oh that's true yeah i kind of forgot about some of that yeah but i'm talking like even older than like ghost of the shell a lot of this stuff i mean talking like the cutie honey era you know oh um, yeah 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 and that's like you know, it's screwball head, screwball etchy, right? You know, it's just like, right. it, and I think Gynax, sort of early Gynax, was a specialist in this kind of, uh, in this kind of, in this kind of using etchy as a comic device. Uh, and because early Gynax was very influential, a lot of a lot of other studios ended up doing it too. Um, so, and I think we see less of that than we used to in anime, and where where it has become a little bit more like here's the, the recent example I think that is most telling that most interesting to discuss is Uzaki Chan. Where, where, what category do you place that? Um, you know, because it's obvious that her breasts are the main selling point of that show. I don't think there's any, I don't see how you can dispute it. Uh, and that show became a hit because of her boobs. I mean, let's be honest. It's not the brilliant writing that made Uzaki Chan a hit. Uh, but it is a comedy and her physical stature is used as a comic device. But I also think that it's the sexualization of Uzaki Chan, who at least is a, you know, at least she's 18, at least we have that going or 19, whatever. So at least she's not a child. But I think that that's overtly the reason why that show exists and why it succeeds is the sexualization of that character. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, to what you're saying, I think it has evolved and it's become less and less of a narrative device and more of a thing that they need to serve on the side. It's kind of like if you think of anime as a happy meal, it's like the toy that you have to give the kid so that it so that it doesn't get bored. <laughs> Good analogy. Good analogy. Good analogy. I like it. Yeah, and I and I do miss when it was used either to comedic effect and even stuff like Love Hina, where it was, you know, the 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 main character would accidentally yeah. do something skeevy and then he would get beat up for it because he deserved to get beat up for it. He Akuma, uh, Akumatsu Ken is like the the poster boy for this style. Of like his Nagima is is loaded with it too, it, with this kind of unintentional, you know, uh, pratfalls and you know, and it's this kind of thing. He's the he's the king of it, yeah, for sure. And it gets old after a while, honestly. Yeah, it does. But I think what's interesting about Nagima is the fact that Nagima is a underage boy, and yeah. he's very pure and not at all intending to do some of the things that you know ends up happening, and so. There's, I think it's even more successful than Love Hina, where it's just, you know, this neat guy who wants to get into Tokyo University. Yeah, but then again, Nagima is a, is a harem series about an 11-year-old boy with a bunch of 14-year-old girls, too. Yeah. Which, which and is pretty, and it's pretty overt about it. I mean, it's to the point with the Pactios and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if that sort of stuff bothers you, I could, I could see Nagima being kind of a problem. 
but I kind of get, you know, Akamatsu, the thing about Akamatsu is it never comes off as too crass to me because he's such a total goofball. Yes. That to me, it comes off as just goofy rather than crass most of the time. And I, and I, so it doesn't generally bother me even in Nagima. And I think Nagima's and Love Hina to some extent are both kind of overtly, they, they say what they are very quickly. So you know whether you want to stay in or you want to get out with those things. And I think tonally, I think tone is the big thing that you kind of hinted at there. Tone is really important to sell something. And if it's if it totally makes sense and if it's funny, then then it's a little bit more palatable to the audience, I think, than something where it just comes out of left field as the Happy Meal toy, as it were. Yeah, I think when you punch your ticket for an Akimatsu Ken series, you know what you're going to get. Yep, yep. And and to that point, I know we've been talking a lot about like examples for male dominated stuff. Do you think the female audience is given as much proportional stuff cuz there's the Oh no, 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 no. I don't not as much. No, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah, and I think that's a problem, right? Cuz there's free, right, that you can think of, and then there's some like reverse harem stuff and some Otome game adaptions. But most of the time, I think the female audience isn't served well, even though they're a big part of the uh, anime manga uh, customer base, especially with uh, doujinshi and stuff like that. I know Haikyuu is hugely popular because of the doujinshi scene, and it's primarily female, if I'm not mistaken, right? Oh, absolutely. Now, here's my... And that's an interesting point. Do you think that Haikyuu has has man service do you think do you think that it's a man service anime or is it just massively popular because the characters sort of lend themselves to dojinsi riffing on that i mean that's the question is there's no question stuff like haikyuu yamushi pedal kuroko no basuke these are massively 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 popular with women and in the dojinsi world there's literally thousands of dojinsi of of hentai dojinsi about these series but do you think the series themselves have fan service or no? So for all of them, except Kuro no Basuke, I would say they just lend themselves to that mold. And I think it's very telling that they're, they're set up that way. I definitely see it in Haikyuu where there's a top and a bottom. And <laughs> some of that is just left to the, the dynamics between some of the main protagonists and the characters. They are given almost those roles that fans can then fill in. Kuroko no Basuke, I would say, is, goes a step further. It does actually have man service with tons of shirtless guys and abs and all that stuff. Um, and, and it gets closer to free, although I don't think it's in free territory, as it were. Right. But all the other ones, I think, are just set up to have that mold. And you can kind of... It's similar to how a lot of uh, male-dominated shows will have like multiple waifus as it were characters right. like there's the sundre there's the whatever i think it's the same thing there would you agree yeah I, and and i you know i do think there are man service series that that cater to this audience i think they exist uh but you asked if there was as much and that's my yes. answer is no there's not and and is that a problem well probably it should be even to some extent uh, at this point it's clear the industry still believes that there's more money coming in from from guys than women uh, on this score, which is why they produce more anime for for the male audience, but there is there are series free, perhaps being the most infamous or legendary. But there's plenty of others. They're they're out there. They're just not as many, and a lot of them tend to be more like a little bit more. As you said, it's interesting because with the with the with the shows that even I mean, Otome games are sort of their own subgenre. But I, I think generally speaking, a lot of these shows that are that are geared toward female otaku are more like, as you describe high, high Q, they're more about leaving it kind of vaguely suggesting kind of where this goes and then leaving it to the audience and the Dojin writers to come up with the, with the rest. Whereas I think with the series, and, and Lord knows there are gajillions of, of hentai doujinshi on the male for the guys series too, aimed at guys. But I do think it's more a case of overtly just spelling it out in the anime that are geared toward the male audiences. Whereas with the female audiences, there's more of this kind of just suggesting at it and then leaving the rest of the imagination, which I think maybe says something about the difference in the male and female libido. I don't know, but it's an interesting thing anyway. Yes. And the one thing I want to talk about, because we've mentioned all these downsides of fan service in the traditional male sense, I feel like for a series like Haikyuu, 
do you think because they have to cater to this audience, which is a big part of their whole financial support, that they don't address things like romance and coupling and stuff like that? Like I know with Haikyuu specifically, you mentioned, you know, you wanted to see more romance with Hinata and, you know, the manager girl or whatever. Right. Yachi. And yeah, Yachi. And if if they do that, though, won't that piss off the female fans? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. And yes, you're right. I think I think that they they have to steer away from this because they don't want to they don't want to close any doors for the audience because that will that will lessen the overall appeal of the series commercially. So yes, I do think that is an unfortunate side effect of knowing their audience. And I don't think that the writers are necessarily allowed to go places they would perhaps like to go because they they know what their expectations are and they they they're discouraged from from defying those expectations. Yeah, and I think that's not just an issue with female centric uh, things like IQ that we were mentioning, but male wise as well. Mm. Uh, I think Bleach didn't solve the the issue of which girl Ichigo would go for because there were two main ones until the very end, and I won't spoil who it was. But the only time that I think those manga, and I think Naruto did the same thing, they couldn't decide on who Naruto was interested in until much later in the story when basically Kishimoto at that point was untouchable and he could end it however he wanted. So um, I do wonder if this aspect of fan service and fan fantasization um does detract from stories and i think we've both kind of agreed that it does yeah and let's just say also if we could just take this whole waifu thing and throw that out in the garbage disposal that would be great for me as far as i'm concerned but then how would we have all these like topic uh those poll of the weeks of your favorite waifu and who wins the waifu of the year yeah oh what a tragedy it would be if those things went away (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I I agree with you. I I don't get the the obsession over waifu or husbandos too. For the record, is it husband or husbandu? I call it husbandu. I've seen sure. husbando, but anyway, you were gonna say. I'm sorry. Yeah, there is just a funny thing where um actually I think my dot waifu or whatever is an actual domain name that you can go to and it's a picture of a waifu just kind of chilling <laughs> there. So somebody <laughs> took the time to. Because I just like, I was messing around with my friend. This is a college story. And we're just messing around, typing in weird URLs. And I was like, I'm going to type my waifu.net and see if we get something. And somebody took the time to not only buy that domain, but put an actual waifu in there. So Yeah, well, there you go. I would have bought that domain with the idea that I could probably sell it. But, um, you know, did you you watch or read Kono Bijutsumu Niwa Monday Ga Aru? Yes, yes, I did. I, I watch and read it. Uh, both the anime and the manga are absolutely wonderful. But one of the things I love about this series, in addition to the fact that I just think the characters are so are so lovable in that series, they're just really great, fun kids. But the the male character, the boy, the male lead, is obsessed with waifus, right? And so his his whole thing is he's an art. He's in the art. It's an art club, duh. But he's like the he's the most talented artist. I think it's fair to say he's a really really good artist. Yes. But he only likes to do waifus. And the girl he's in love with, or who is in love with him, well, maybe a Freudian slip there, but the girl who's in love with him is like, the whole thing is like, she has to compete with his 2D brides. Yep. And it's not, you know, it's not a deep psychologically probing sort of, it, that's not what it is. This is not Evangelion. It's a comedy, but it does take a very interesting and kind of smart look at the whole uh, question of the 2D bride obsession and and how real girls can compete with it and all that in a in a in a comedic way and I think boils it down to basically where it where it really is which is like at the 13 year old boy mentality level right uh, so for him as a second year middle school middle school student it's not scary or frightening or or wrong that he has this obsession it's kind of normal right but. You, when you're 18, that probably wouldn't be the case. And I think there are ways in which this series kind of gives you allusions and nods to that without going right out and saying it, which I think is kind of one of the many reasons I find it to be very appealing in its own way. Yeah, I almost saw it as satire because I agree. This whole concept of I want to make the I want to draw the perfect waifu like creeped me out and in a good way it was funny and i think the tone as we talked about before the tone supported this comedy 
But let's be clear that a 13 year old or whatever his age is, a middle school kid talking about drawing the perfect anime girl. That's messed up, man. And, and, and the fact that really, yeah, I feel like it is like, do you, you want to draw the perfect woman? Not like, not in terms of personality or things like that, but just like the perfect drawn anime girl that, that kind of, that kind of like showed me that he had some like mental issues and you know, mm. the girl likes him because of how kind he is, how nice he is. And right. I mean, there's, there's other allusions to there's something deeper underneath between the both of them, right. which I enjoy. Right. But I mean, it's, well, it's played for. Th- can I rebut? Go ahead. I mean, I think that the two characters we're talking about here are Mizuki is the girl and Subaru is the boy. Okay. So um, I think Subaru, first of all, as you say, he is a nice kid. I mean, he's, he's a good person. Yes. He's, he's, he's a good boy. He, you know, he, he just happens to be obsessed with anime. Right. And he loves, he, so he has a very kind of an almost R15, except in his case, it's, it's like PG 13. Uh, he has this obsession with, with, with this kind of idealized, version of women i don't think we're meant to see him as being messed up i really don't i think we're meant to see him as being kind of constrained by his immaturity as you know as a 13 year old and i think it's fair to say that broadly speaking 13 year old girls are more mature than 13 year old boys i think that's probably a fair statement and i think that's one of the elements of comedy that the series trades on is that difference between the maturity level between girls and boys in middle school and i think it does so very effectively and i don't think we're meant to see him as being kind of like kind of warped and i don't think we're meant to see his desire to paint these 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 2d brides i don't think we're meant to see that as being disturbing or or messed up i think we're much just meant that i'm we're meant to see it as a as a kind of a manifestation almost kind of a, a, a form of chuni bio, you know, it's a kind of a, kind of a, just a, a relatively normal kind of a obsession of, of a kid in that age group living in a fantasy life. Uh, and, and if he were like a, you know, totally antisocial or, 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 or clearly, you know, disturbed in other ways, I think you might have a case, but the fact that he is able to function normally you know, it has a normal relationship with with the, with his friends in the club. He has that that other girl who's also kind of an otaku, who's like a good friend to his, and he has a friendship with her. Uh, and I think we're meant to see him as basically being a normal kid with more than normal talent and a bit of an obsession that, in an older person, would be bothersome, but in his age, I think is kind of okay. That's kind of how I think he's meant to be taken. Yeah, and I don't disagree with you. I guess what I meant to say was. It's it's indicative of a culture in like anime fandom where that's the that's the almost boyish thing to do. Yeah, you know, yeah. like in a way, that's the satire that I saw. No, I and I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're on the same page there. I think I was just not as articulate about what I was trying to say as I should have been. So I appreciate the correction there. Yeah, I agree with you. I think I think I'm not. Yeah, I, I think we only disagree a little bit, maybe in terms of degree. But I think he is meant as a satire to a certain extent of this of this thing that exists in Japan now with 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 Japanese teenage males uh, with with this whole waifu thing. He is definitely meant as a satire of that. I just don't think it's meant to like cast negatively on him as a person. I think he's just more of a representation of it. And the, her no, and I agree with that. And and Mizuki's like quixotic quixotic uh obsession with trying to to fight this is really the source of a lot of the comedy right and uh, the, the funny thing is and no spoilers but the funny thing is you can see the two worlds starting to merge for him a little bit as the series goes along where reality starts to intrude more and more into his fantasy world and i think that's both very funny and very cute but it's also kind of a manifestation of what happens when we grow up right uh, and I think we're literally seeing this take place with Subaru is he's starting to grow up. He's starting to see reality intrude more and more into this fantasy world that he's created, even if he's not aware of it at the time. And that leads us to a perfect segue into kind of our overall thoughts, thoughts on this. Do mm. you think fan service is going to grow uh, up at some point or because it has changed as we've mentioned before is there going to be a growth on this point are anime fans and the industry as a whole 
going to grow up and not let the fan service intrude on the story and detract from it and stuff like that? Or do you think we're kind of going to be in this zone and in stasis for uh, years to come? Uh, I, when you said four, I was about to say ever. Uh, I know. I, I don't think, I don't think it's going to go away. Uh, and I'm not like that upset that it's not going to go away. It's just, it's part of the fabric quilt of anime. It's, it, you know, and it's, it's just part of the deal. Uh, it'll evolve as it has evolved. It's always evolved that the form will change, the tone will change and it, it'll, 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 it'll change in subtle ways. Uh, but is it going to stop? Is it going to go away? No, I don't think it ever will. I really don't. All right. I I think so as well. I do think, I just hope it doesn't go the way of the Western media because that was a thing in the hard edge 90s. Yeah. And I don't want to go back to that. I do appreciate it where it is. And as long as it's kept, the overt stuff is kept to the series that are very unshamedly saying what they are i think it's it's fine i am able to tolerate it more but i think as i'm growing older more and more so and i'm i'm in my 30s right now i think it annoys me more than it used to Mm. as i think i've noticed even in this conversation Mm. where love hina when i originally saw it didn't bother me but now if i watched it for a myriad of reasons i would probably not tolerate it as much so yeah i suspect i could not get through love hina at this point i that's my feeling um you know i think it's also worth pointing out i know we were going along here but it's worth pointing out in in your last point netflix there is a danger to netflix increasing involvement that they could uh, begin to uh imbue a more western view of sex and fan service into anime and i do actually think that if you look at the body of work that netflix has funded the there there is a more of this kind of Game of Thrones style Western sexuality to it than we usually see in anime, and I do think that is a, perhaps a cautionary note with Netflix increasing involvement in anime. That could be a side effect that people like you and I may not welcome. Yeah, I agree, and I think Netflix has been doing it. They did it with the Castlevania series, and their their stuff is definitely data driven and marketing driven so mm. we'll we'll have to see and maybe we'll check back in a couple of years and see where uh fan services yep. evolved to yep all right cool well with that chunky thick boy out of the way <laughs> we'll uh move on and we'll we'll take our little toys we've we finished our happy meal and we'll head on over to the last part of this podcast. Oh, let's close our fan service discussion with a discuss of chunky, meaty bits and toys. Let's let's do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, I'm sorry. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. You may get who knows. Maybe there will be Setsukin and Enzo fan service on the YouTube channel as well. Who knows? That may be part of our broadcast. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> <Nobody>. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Let's Owadi. move on. Okay. Let's move on. All right, everybody. All the sexual innuendo jokes are kind of a thing of the past now because we're kind of wrapping up. We're calming down a little bit now. And we like to end our podcasts with listener feedback, questions. Uh, And last time we asked you guys to fill out a survey. So we're actually going to jump into that uh, first and foremost. And I would say a good chunk of you guys responded to it. It was actually more than I was expecting. So we were very happy with those of you who took the time to go through and kind of help us steer the ship a little bit. Because while we're the drivers, you guys are the, the crew, as it were and the people that reside on the ship of ours. So, um, Guardian Enzo, the first thing I want to talk about is actually uh, some of the statistical stuff I'm going to just avoid, but I did find it interesting because we asked about how people primarily watch anime, and the server respondents, 76% of them actually watch weekly, episode by episode, uh, every season, and then 23% do the bulk watch binge thing. Um, I intentionally didn't give people the option to do both because I wanted to see which one they preferred. So for people who were annoyed by that, I'm sorry, but that was all by design. And then before you comment, I also want to talk about manga because manga people, uh, nobody actually in the anime said they don't watch anime or rarely watch anime, which makes sense. This is an anime podcast with manga as well. 
uh, mostly due to Guardian Enzo's efforts. And then we asked, how do you primarily read manga? And 38% read chapters weekly, which mad respect to you guys. And then 30% actually don't read manga, which I found very interesting. Um, I, I, they, they didn't say they don't want to read manga. They rarely read it. So they're in kind of my camp where I rarely read manga. And then uh, another 30%, so I think the rarely and the volume by volume was tied for 30%, um, where they, they either read it volume by volume or they rarely read it. Any thoughts on this stuff for the survey people? No, I, I think I've only ever watched anime uh, weekly. As in, you know, I, occasionally I'll binge now that in the, we're in the Netflix era. And there have been like stuff from back catalog that I've occasionally binged. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I think that for most of our most of our listeners are probably more serious anime fans than casual anime fans and i think that we're the ones who are more likely to be that weekly uh that 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 weekly weekly viewing kind of a crowd and it's interesting that as netflix continues to grow their influence to see whether they adapt to anime viewing habits or they do as they've mostly been doing which is that try to get anime viewers to adapt to them so it'll be very interesting to see. I think our survey basically confirms what I see as the as the predominant strain in anime fans of how they like to watch. And Netflix mm-hmm. is trying to push them in another way. So we'll see where that goes. There could be a little, uh, Im- Im- you know, immovable force and uh, or what irresistible object kind of a thing going on there. We'll see how that plays out. Yes. And then the next question kind of related I want to jump to is, I asked how long, or we asked how long have they been listening to Nataku for, and most, uh, 70% of people actually found us two months ago with the Anime Chat Volume 2, but I was happy to see that 30% of people uh, actually found us from the original version from four years ago, so uh, mad props to the 30% that did that. That was a long time to wait, and we're really happy to have you. And of course, the six, 70% of you guys, you are still like this is about 10 to 15% of our total uh, viewer base or listener base. And you guys are all fairly awesome, right? Absolutely. I, I you know, and uh, I actually, you know, I'm not too surprised. I, I actually wondered if it might even be a higher percentage who are here. So I'm sort of encouraged actually by the fact of how many new listeners we got. I think that's great. Uh, The mix is interesting. The mix is good. It's a good number. Yes, yes. And on that note, um, the the, similar kind of divide here um, with where people listen to, and this is just for survey people, but 61% listen on YouTube, which is higher than I would have expected, Uh, but so good. Uh, YouTube is a big part of, you know, our whole release schedule and all that stuff. And then 38% uh, use podcast services and that's iTunes, Spotify, and Overcast. I kind of bunch them together. So uh, survey people primarily on YouTube, it seems like. Yeah, survey people primarily on YouTube. And I think among our uh, podcast services, I think based on the statistics I've seen, iTunes does seem to be the number one in, in that group, which I yes. guess is not it's not really surprising, is it? So Yeah, and of the ones that we can track, because a lot of people, I think one of uh, uh, the listeners over at Lost in Anime said this, he added it as an RSS feed, which is an option. Mm. So when, when you add it as an RSS feed, we can't really track you, but you can listen to the podcast. So if you're doing that, that's fine. We don't need to track you. We're not Facebook. So, um, yeah, just happy to know that people are listening from our end. Yep. All right. So then this is the first big question that I want to kind of spend some time on Guardian Enzo. And that is favorite part of the show. And to both of our surprises, the number one winner was topic of the week at 53% with the anime news following by 23% at number two. And then three was manga recommendation corner at seven percent and then surprising me even more so was that there was what we're watching at seven percent so some people actually like what we're watching that was more of like a thing i wanted to do and i think you wanted to do as well but we never expected that to actually be somebody's favorite part of the week so that's that's interesting to hear but i want to talk about one and two specifically guardian enzo and what mm. how that relates to the future cuz we we talked about like splitting it down and there's further questions later on about making shorter shows 
but we had primarily thought about the anime news kind of being the uh, dominant thing that we would do weekly from here on out if we did a shorter show. And this topic of the week thing definitely created some pause, did it not? Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair statement. It was a it was a result we weren't necessarily expecting. Yeah, and we're listening. and And for those of you who like the topic of the week, we do understand that. Uh, that is definitely making us think and turn our gears. And we'll get to it in a little bit. But I wanted to kind of highlight that these are the two uh, big winners, and then obviously manga recommendation corner. And what we're watching uh, are tied at seven percent as well. So some people like that. Uh, surprisingly, nobody liked the haiku challenge. <laughs> well, there you go. Anyway, let's move on. So the other important question was this, this idea of length and the ideal length of an episode, according to our friends here is one to 1.5 hours. That was 61%. Uh, and then 15% wanted either two hours or 30 to 45 minutes. And then one person at 7%, I think one or two people, uh, wanted it even longer, and I put that in there just in case you know somebody wanted a Joe Rogan style four hour podcast, which I don't think we can do until we get paid to do this yep. full time. Yep. But we would love to. I, I, well, I don't know if I would, but we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll think about it. Depends on how good the pay is. Well, and how good we are, because I don't know if anybody could tolerate me speaking for four hours. But. Um, moving on, uh, so I asked, asked some stuff about audio quality and it was generally rated high. We had a 3.8 average rating, which is, uh, for compared to our last, uh, go around, this is way, 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 way better. Yeah. 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 The other thing that was interesting was I asked kind of because I was just curious, do you prefer a host? And most people said, no, I like both equally. And there's actually a survey comment that I'm going to jump to uh, where somebody said that they put, um, no, I like both equally because they would feel bad if they didn't. (laughs) I honestly was expecting you to go uh, to be liked more than me. And that's just because I think you're just better at speaking and all that stuff. And originally when we did the podcast, uh, if you remember, you hosted every week. But, you know, I the reason for the switching hosts, just to give listeners some insight, is A, you would be surprised at how much effort it is to run a show, uh, compile it, and then also speak at the same time. So it it gives each of us some some breaks, I think, mentally to kind of recharge and stuff like that. And then we also put our own spins on it. And as you guys have noticed, we have very differing opinions on certain things and this allows us both to kind of helm the wheel and do things the way we want to so majority of people want us both which is good um i don't know if they're all some of them are being nice but um i think that's something that i don't think is going to change i think the back and forth is good and it keeps us both fresh wouldn't you agree yeah yeah absolutely all right moving on then um some people actually did like the thumbnails. Most people did not care for the thumbnails. To the 23% that did, thank you. I actually spend a lot of time on those <laughs> just because I am ai have a graphic design background and I care about that stuff. The more interesting thing is, are the titles of the episodes informative and interesting? And surprisingly, uh, 84% said yes and only 15% said no. And the reason it's surprising to me is because I'll be honest, guys, Guardian Enzo comes up with some really cool titles, but I end up going with the more boring title just because it gets our podcast more views and stuff like that. We're playing with the YouTube algorithm and the Google algorithm, and we're trying to get the podcast to as many people as possible. So I'm glad that at least the clickbaitiness sometimes of the titles doesn't detract from the podcast and does still give you a snapshot of what's coming. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know much about, about the, the SEO side of it. So I defer on these. Uh, I, like he said, I come up with, I come up with titles just based on strictly like, uh, which, which really tells me that when I title stuff on my own website, I probably should be thinking more about SEO and less about, but I mean, you mostly episode titles are just episode titles, but yeah, I mean, uh, the, the thing I like about the titles that we end up going with is that they they are very informative about, uh, in addition to being good for uh, search algorithms, I think they're very informative about what's actually in the episode itself, which is why I think people like them. Yes, 
Um, the other question, which I think is important, is about release schedule. And most people, 69%, said that they like the re- weekly release schedule. Uh, 15% said they would prefer less, and 15% said they would prefer more. So the weekly schedule is definitely something that I think we want to keep in some form or another moving forward, yes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, then I want to talk about this question, which I kind of threw in there just because I wanted to see what people would say. And that was the how fair unbiased are we? Uh, 3.5 average rating. 30% of people think we're at a 3. Uh, 7% said we were 2. Um, and then 61% said that we were a 4. So the higher the number, the more fair we are. And then I want to read this uh, comment by uh, Blastrix over at Lost in Anime where he said, also, you had a question about bias and fairness. I don't find bias to be a negative trait. I kind of expect anime critics to be biased and unfair. So at at least my answer in that survey is not meant as a critique. Mm. Uh, And I suspect he's in the two or three range there. So what are you, what are your thoughts on that question? I, yeah, if, if he, if he hadn't said it, I would have, uh, that's my thoughts on it. I don't think being fair and unbiased, to be honest, is a, is a goal in this. I, I, it's, I don't think we would have a podcast if that was our goal. Uh, we want to, we want to be inclusive and I think we want to be, we want to be, we want to judge every show, every manga, everything we talk about in its own context but this is an opinion show. How can we have an, an opinion show? It's like, you know, if you're old enough to remember Siskel and Ebert, the movie critics who were the, you know, famous movie critics mm-hmm. at the movies and all that. If, if, would you say that a goal of their show would, would be, be fair and unbiased? No, I think the whole point of their show is bias because it's, it's a subjective opinion. And I think a lot of what we do, it's not quite so clear cut as if we were movie reviewers, but a lot of what we do here is strictly subjective and we're giving our subjective views. And if we strove to tone those down in order to get a higher score in that category, I think the podcast would be less interesting. That's so that's why I agree with Blastrix a hundred percent. I, I, you know, you can answer two there if you want. You can answer three. I don't think we're one, but I mean, I, I, the goal is not to be a five. That's the whole point. Yeah, or be a one. We don't want to be obnoxious either, but I think if we're in the two to three range, I think we're spicy enough to add some spice to your anime viewing life. Yeah, just honest, you know, that's it. Yep, yep. And I think we should be uh, like, I think we're fairly open about our biases. Like you've said, you don't like light novels. So it's no surprise if uh, the latest isekai is going to like drive you up the wall or, you know, for me, fan service seems like it's a, it's a deal breaker almost at at this point. So Mm. we, you are, you will be aware of our biases at least. Absolutely. Um, Moving on this question, would people like to see more content from us? And a hundred percent said, yes. So we have heard that loud and clear. And then we followed up with a question of which content. And the number one winner was anime manga reviews, full spoiler discussions. So I think we need to uh, find those in at some point. Number two was industry interviews, which let's just say we're, we're actively working on that as to when it will happen. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see, but that is something that's in the works. Number three was guests on our podcasts. So guests is a huge demand as well, uh, which, you know, Guardian Enzo is pushing for that every week. And I am kind of the hold up there because I'm trying to make sure we actually execute on it fairly well. Number four was a video essays and then podcast on other topics, video games, Western TV, movies was also uh, there at number five. So all these pretty healthy options which is um, good to hear. So we'll we definitely plan to execute on all of those at some point or the other as we grow, right? Absolutely, absolutely. All right. So this is the big question, and this will lead into a little bit of a discussion we'll have. I asked the question: Would you listen to a smaller thirty to forty-five uh, weekly pod, thirty to forty-five minute weekly podcast episode that just focused on news and listener questions? Eighty-three percent said yes. 16% said no. So there were, were some people, I, I was hoping that this would be as close to 100% as it could be, because this is the direction that I want to go in moving forward. 
And it's not because I don't like the format of the podcast as it is today. Uh, Guardian Enzo and I spent a lot of time thinking this a new format up. We added our own flavors to it. And I do believe that this longer two-hour podcast is almost the final form of how the podcast should be. It's just that podcasts are really hard to attract new people with and to grow with and do all that stuff. And they're also really, really hard to edit. And a lot of this does come down to like the fact that we're a two-person scrappy startup here at Notaku. It's Guardian Enzo and it's me. And we both host it. And then, you know, Guardian Enzo does some of the descriptions and a lot of the writing. And then I do a lot of the editing. And so we want to try to maximize our time to be able to provide you, our listeners and our audience, with the best content that we can. So in that light, the thing that I want to probably do uh, moving forward is to do that 30 to 45 minute weekly podcast for news and listener questions. And then uh, we'll jump into the other part of it. But Guardian Enzo, you have trepidations about this. So uh, do you want to share those with the listeners? And then, yeah. Sure, sure. And I think I think I want our listeners to understand that, you know, not only do Setsuken and I, Setsuken both and I both have day jobs, which is how we manage to pay our rent and put food on the table, uh, but also that we have websites too. I mean, and, and you know, so those are not being abandoned in the course of, of this. So uh, Notaku, we have, in a sense, I think it would be fair to say conflicting conflicting considerations with this which is we want we want this to be uh, something that gets bigger and grows and draws a bigger audience and becomes a, a, an active anime fan community manga fan community and i think we're both committed to making that happen while at the same time the demands of everyday life uh continue to exert their pull and i think that we have to make concessions from the one to the other i i think that we have to find a way to make those two things coexist uh, you know, going to the 30, 45 minute uh, weekly podcast on news and listener questions, I think that in many ways that is the logical next step for us to go as long as we supplement that with other things as, as we certainly will. I, it just your responses did, did, you know, I want you guys to know you made it pretty clear that you really like those deep dive discussions. And in fact, a lot of you said you wanted longer deep dive discussions, right? So um, w- we need to find a way uh, to, we, we, here's the thing. We're going to make some changes. We're going to do some things differently. This is, we, we did a core, we, we stuck with a format for the core and we, we executed it, I think pretty damn well, I would say. And now we're going to start to make changes. We're going to start to try to uh, roll your feedback into what we do, uh, and, and merge that with the demands of our lives and our goals for the, for, for the project in the future and, and come up with it with something that works. And, that so when we make changes, part of the process of making changes is continuing to get feedback from you guys as what's working and what isn't. And I want you guys to understand that you know we are writing this in pencil. We're not etching it in stone. We're going to do stuff. Yes. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't click with you guys, nothing is going to click with one hundred percent of you. We understand that. But if in general it doesn't continue to to give the audience what they want and grow this and grow the project, then we'll we'll tweak. We'll go in another direction. And so bear with us, but the most important thing is continue to give us feedback and let us know what you think is working. Just because we don't have a formal survey out there doesn't mean that we're not deathly interested in everything you have to say. You have lots of avenues in which you can provide it. And that's how we're going to know. Well, there's other ways too. I mean, we have, you know, you know, we, we can analytics and stuff, but really the best way is for you to actually take the time to, to sit down and say in writing, you know, this is great. I wish you would do more of this. I wish you would do less of this. Please keep that feedback coming. We will continue to evolve and change uh, in part based on our own preferences, but also in big part based on yours. So we may go in some directions right now, which some of you love, some of you don't know love as much. Maybe that's a different direction after that. It, it, you know, we, it doesn't have to be 13 weeks at a time. We can we can make changes really whenever we want to. It's just we wanted to give ourselves a full core of episodes to to really get this format down and give you guys an opportunity to see the various facets of, of Nataku so you could start to decide what your priorities are as well as we could. And that's kind of at the stage we are right now. Now we're going to start to make changes. 
and I think we're going to be open to adapting fairly quickly. Uh, you know, we're going it, to, cause it'll be apparent pretty quickly. Uh, we have to give things a chance. Uh, so it's not going to be like, you know, oh, we're five minutes in, let's change the format. We don't like it. No, it's not going to be that, but we can make changes and we can adapt and we will continue to do that. So I, I am committed because you guys have made it clear to me that the deep dive stuff is very important to you. Uh, so, um, I'm committed to making sure that that remains a big part of what we do going forward, because it's very clear that a lot of you really want that. Um, And it's also very clear to me that a lot of you want stuff like, like when we said video format, one of the top first place winners was manga recommendations. So that makes me feel good, right? Because that's a really important thing for me. And I'm going to find a way to make sure we continue to have manga recommendations as part of the site going forward and, and maybe in some new and exciting ways that are different than what we've done up to now. Um, yeah. So we're, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a, this is a living creature, Notaku, you know, and yes. living creatures if grow and evolve and change. And that's the whole, the whole, the whole theme for us, the whole goal for us is grow build back better, right? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to grow, evolve and change. We're going to continue to do, uh, we're going to continue to solicit and respond to your feedback, both on the air and in, and in what we do. And, uh, that's a, that should be a healthy process. And this should be a collaborative process, not just between Satsuki and me, but between both of us and, and the listeners. And that's the most important thing going forward. Uh, very articulately and detailedly said. So I, I did like that you mentioned the next question, which was uh, we asked if people would like a longer deep dive topic discussion podcast, and seventy six percent said yes, as you said. So most of them. So that combined with the next question, which you also alluded to, would you like to see any of these in video format? Number one was manga recommendations. The second one was travel videos, so anime stores in Japan, outside, etc. The third was video essays. Number four was manga reviews. And then number five was an old segment that we did once upon a time, Ask Enzo, and I also added Ask Satsukin in case mm. somebody wanted to, if we wanted to flip it. And all of those got votes. Manga recommendation, mm. obviously, at the top, with travel videos at number two. So... I definitely want to do more video content. That that was the original idea of Notaku. And so one of the reasons why we're kind of lo- uh, decreasing some of the pressure off of the podcast side is so we can do more video content and continue to grow and be better and do some of these things that I think we can bring to the YouTube space that isn't there right now. And that's always been the idea, right? We want to create a product. There is no other podcast that does things in a very kind of serious news way. We're, we're analyzing things. We're taking anime and manga fairly seriously, which is different from a lot of other podcasts. And we try to be funny as much as we can. But really, we, we respect the medium and the industry uh, in a way that I don't think other podcasts do. And so we want to bring that over to the video as well, as much as I, we can. It just did. Video is a lot of work. It is. Video is a lot of work. There's no question about it. Video is a lot of work. So um, we have to, that requires us to be, especially you, but both of us, it requires us to be judicious and smart in how we attack it. And also there's the whole matter of YouTube and and the various challenges of, of, of video content on YouTube anyway, which we don't need to go into, but just rest assured that presents its own set of challenges. And I also want to just make a quick note that back in the day, the Ask Enzo, uh, the Ask Enzo uh, videos were the most popular ones in terms of view counts. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm glad that there are still some people who voted for those. Maybe there's some of the old graybeards who were with us from the first round who said that they discovered us the first time. But I, I personally would love to have Ask Enzo and Ask Setsuken be a part of the be a part of the of, of of the franchise because I think those are really great and I think that those are a great opportunity for us to to maybe do mini deep dives if you will uh, and I think that's the final thing I would say on that score is the podcast is in the in my vision Notaku is like is a franchise right and and it's a various different aspects of that franchise and the podcast is the sort of like the cornerstone it's but it's it's only one of several elements that are part of the Notaku franchise. It's the Whopper. 
Yeah, if you will, it's the Big Mac. Um, but it's not the only part of it. So far, it's been the only part of it. What's changing now is we're going to start bringing in the other parts and and the, and they're going to sort of revolve around the podcast, but the podcast is only going to be one element in in a in a sort of a solar system. It'll be the sun in the solar system that is Notaku. Yes. Speaking of solar system, I do want to read through some of the final suggestion comments that because uh, I asked a question at the end, which was what would people suggest? Any suggestions? And some themes emerged. So I want to quickly go over each of the themes. So give me a second, Guardian Enzo. I'm going to read a bunch of comments and then we'll kind okay. of discuss them as a whole. And I know we're going long, but we want to address all of this because this is, I think, fairly important. So Special occasion. Special occasion. Once in a lifetime. <laughs> okay. So the first theme was, and I like this a lot, keep doing what you're doing. But people didn't just say that. They added something to it. So one thing I noticed as a theme was a few people said that they wanted us to continue. And I don't know if we gave the impression that we were going to stop after 13 episodes, but I think as we've said ad-, ad nauseum, this is a marathon for us, not a sprint. So we'll be going. So um, there was uh, a bunch of stuff on that. Um, uh, some people said, you know, they really enjoy the podcast. They can't watch anime as much. So this keeps them up to date. Um, a lot of se- uh, people said, just keep going and keep polishing this. It's a winning format. And I do agree. Uh, there, are, We definitely got something really special here. Um, and, uh, one person did say that, you know, lean more into the two person dynamic, which I agree with. That's also one of the reasons why guests is something I'm really thinking hard of with guardian Enzo. We definitely want to preserve the appeal of Notaku, which is that two person dynamic between me and him and how different we are and how similar we are in certain aspects. Uh, And a third person, we just really have to execute that well. So whether that's one of us interviewing a guest one on one, or if it's uh, if there's a three way that we could do somehow that works, we'll we'll talk about that. But any thoughts on the keep doing what you're doing, Guardian Enzo? Well, thank you first of all that for saying it. Um, and if we did give that impression, obviously that wasn't our intention. So absolutely, uh, this is probably as far as the guest issue. Uh, this is probably one of the areas where we have some. You know, Setsuken and I have a different. Uh, shading in the way we view that. I think I'm less concerned with what that what that could do to the dynamic than Satsuken is. Uh, I you know as long as it's a it's it's a it's a feature as part of a broader broader whole. I think we can do those pretty safely without it really messing up the first person the, the two person dynamic too much. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly am on board with the idea that we want to do it right. So um, and you know that's that's a big part of of you know, in this, in this sector, what we hope to do, this is no secret that that's got to be a part of it at some point. So I think that will be a part of it. Uh, it's just a question of exactly how we decide is the best way to go forward. But that's another one of those things that I'm committed to absolutely in the long term. I want to be a part of this. Yeah, both of us are, I think. So we'll, it'll happen for sure. Uh, we'll do, we just need to iron out the details and how we're going to do it. Um, okay. The next thing, uh, and there's only two themes more, so we'll be about done, educational stuff. A lot of people gave some really interesting suggestions on educational content because a lot of people really like the fact that we're educating them about the industry, the production committee process, the financial stuff. So uh, one thing that somebody suggested was describe a term in anime so if there's any genre related terms or just terms from japanese culture i'm assuming they wanted to talk about that and then uh one person and the reason i'm saying person and not uh telling who the people are is because we we gave the name as optional so i want to respect the fact that certain people might want to be anonymous but one person did uh, recommend that they wanted to see a Japanese word of the week. So from an anime perspective, so maybe we take a word uh, that is used in anime fairly often and we talk about that, romanize it, and then uh, give context to it. So that one I thought was a really interesting. Mm, yeah, I agree. That's an interesting, that is an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. The caveat is we're both not really language experts and 
most of our, I don't know about you, but most of my Japanese, I actually picked up from anime and I can actually speak very broken, decent. Like I can hold a basic conversation in Japanese now after 20 plus years of watching <laughs> anime. Um, so uh, some of that I think we could do, but I think it speaks to a larger goal I have of maybe learning the language. Mm. And if if I get to that, then we we definitely we definitely want to think about this. This could be a show in itself, and I think a fairly successful one. So very good suggestion there. And then uh, the final suggestion was uh, doing more about the production business, history, fan culture of anime topics. So talking about how we kind of uh, with our opinions, we kind of educate people about the industry and stuff like that. People want more of that. And I think they want it more. And this person specifically says, you know, they prefer that over the specific genre discussions that we have about anime, because that just becomes a personal like dislike thing. And they feel that that could go into what we're watching or the manga recommendation corner. So any thoughts on all of that? Well, uh, I'm not necessarily 100% in that camp myself. I, I think genre discussions do have their place, actually. And, and uh, as long as it, as long as you don't get too specific, but I, I think broader genre discussions are important. And I think in a sense, today was almost a genre discussion with the fan service, right? So I think genre discussions can be tied into overall media uh, discussions. And that's where I think they can be useful. As far as the, some of the educational stuff, honestly, I think that was the purpose that Ask Enzo served the first time around. So I think yes. that's, sort of, that's sort of the natural landing spot for that idea. So yes, that, that fits. Uh, and as far as the language of the, uh, the Japanese Word of the Week stuff, the anime Japanese, uh, I'm by no means fluent in the language myself, but I feel comfortable enough in it at this point to where I could lead a discussion on a bit of anime Japanese terminology, I think. And go into the etymology of it and, and the, the, you know, the context, I think. I think I know enough of the language now, both inside the anime subset of it and the language generally, that I would feel fairly comfortable having a, leading a discussion on, on anime terms and anime Japanese uh, from time to time. So I, I think that is something we could do, actually. And the broader goal of learning the language, becoming more fluent, I share that goal. It is something we both want to do. But I think that is, I, I would feel confident enough that I think I could lead a discussion in that area. Perfect. So we'll have something on that soon, I think. I think uh, that definitely, that was a really good suggestion. It struck a light bulb in me and a light bulb in you, Guardian Enzo. Yeah, I like it. All right. Then some MISC suggestions that I couldn't really bunch up. So we'll just rapid fire go through these. One person said that they would love it if we gave the English translated titles besides the Japanese ones, because I think both you and I tend to prefer the Japanese titles for various reasons. So that's just a suggestion. I think we'll do that in the description. I will also say in the description, we generally put a My Anime List link to some of these shows, but maybe we're missing some. And so people are... Um, we Maybe we can be better about that. So I'll I'll try to make sure... I leave notes for all the anime we talk about Um, because Guardian Enzo is the one who puts up the descriptions and the time codes and all that stuff. And we, we have to get better at that as well. I need to help him out and not just completely throw it on him. Okay. Next one. Uh, This one was very interesting. Guardian Enzo. Uh, This person said also, although I understand that you want to avoid spoilers, when you get into specific anime during topic of the week, I often find myself wanting more context details about the story because i'm after often unfamiliar with them and this is something we've talked about before right like you you have uh i'm the one who wants to keep everything pure and avoid spoilers as much as possible and you have at times said that you know we can give more context and stuff like that so i think what i'm thinking guardian enzo is that we just preface with a spoiler warning and we we kind of cut loose a little bit more yeah, I'm down with that. And the irony here is that I think on my own website, I'm I'm often mocked for being totally, totally anal about any spoilers. Uh, so I don't think by I think by by, you know, by dint, I'm I'm very much an anti spoiler person. But I kind of with this commenter, I think that a lot of the times we're constraining ourselves in these conversations by 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 not. And, you know, obviously, with stuff like Higurashi or something like that, I think you want to be careful. 
Uh, even on older stuff like Another or The Sixth Sense, I, there are certain spoilers I wouldn't go even after a warning because you'd be like totally ruining the point of people even watching those shows. But I think there is a lot of times we could go there where, as you say, we could just insert a warning and say, by the way, okay, so let's get into this. But if you don't want to know, this would be a good time to jump ahead to the next time code. I, I think we can do that. Yes, I agree. Uh, the next one, uh, which is uh, kind of an interesting one too, not super interested by the sales stats segment, but no big deal. I do like the idea of breaking down into smaller episodes, blah, blah, blah. I think that was interesting. Some people might not find the sales stats interesting. Let us know, right? I, I tried to go a little bit faster this week, uh, but you know this is something we need more feedback and more opinions on. Wouldn't you agree? Well, sure. And I, respectfully to the person who gave that opinion, thank you for sharing it. We don't know if anybody else shares it. Um, and um, from the news perspective, I think the Oricon rankings are, I think it's pretty important for American and Western fans to know what's happening commercially in Japan, because that that's still drives the majority of where the where things go in the future. Uh, the international market is important, but the Japanese market is still more important. So I, that's why I push to have those Oricon rankings in in the first place. Uh, if there is a broad consensus that people would just assume blow past them, uh, then maybe we can look at it. But I don't know at this point whether that consensus exists. So if if you have strong feelings about those one way or the other, by all means, you know, let us know. Yeah, and I agree with you. I don't think we'll ever take them away because they are important. And I also agreed with you when you wanted to push this. I think either... One of us suggested it, but then we both agreed that this was something we need to do. So what we can do to facilitate it is just kind of throw a time code after the Oricon rankings for people that want to skip that if they so desire. And this person did say, but no big deal. So they weren't like super pushing for it to go away. They just weren't interested. So I thought I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. The last one, which was uh, also something I want more feedback for. Uh, the intro and segment music feels a bit off uh, with the vibe of the classic radio show. Uh, this is something that somebody said as well. So mm. I wanted to list that out there. That's totally me. Uh, I thought it was cool. I think it gives us not a lot of podcasts do that interstitial thing, that transition thing. And um, I just wanted to do it as a stylistic thing. Uh Guardian Enzo, do you have any opinions on that before we wrap up? I like it fine. I I, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I, I if th- this is, like you said, this is a good one to ask for feedback on because what is the broad sense of appeal? I don't think this is deal-breaking if, if for anybody either way. I, I would be shocked if it was, but we obviously want to improve the overall experience. So yeah, I think I too would be curious to hear what more of our listeners think about that. Would you like us to get rid of those altogether? Would you like us to go with something a little bit more like mainstream in terms of the musical of, of the links and the cuts and such, I, uh, you know, as you said, uh, this is an area where you do all the work and I just kind of, you know, tag along. So, uh, I, you know, I certainly never occurred to me, boy, we need to change those. I think they're kind of cool. I think, like you said, they're, they, they, I like that they exist. Uh, I, I would rather have something in that spot, even if we, even if fans say, you know, but we don't like what you, the way you're doing it now, then maybe we could do something different. But I do think, they, they add something to the atmospherics of the, of the show. And I think they're structurally, they're kind of nice too, that they exist. I think it's kind of almost like if you like, you know, like a wipe in, in, in a, if you're watching something in, in a video, yep. you know, Hey, okay, we're transitioning. I think it's important to acknowledge that. Right. So I, I want to have an intro. I want to have, I want to have transition stuff. I want to have that acknowledged in some form if we got 28 responses all saying, no, get rid of it, well, I'd rethink it. But I don't think we're at that point. I, I, I just would be very curious to hear people's thoughts on this, generally speaking, sure. Yeah, I agree. And my plan for this that I haven't discussed with Guardian Enzo, so we might <laughs> change it. But my idea is that every core we change the opening and mm. we maybe add an ending theme. And so the musical core kind of each core kind of changes it a little bit. So that's interesting. We'll, yeah. we'll talk more about. Yeah. All right, cool. So that was our chunky survey segment. We are going to kind of quickly sign off now because I think we've taken too much time. So if we missed a question or something, we'll get into it next week for sure. 
because I think we we really kind of made this episode. It, it'll probably end up being our longest episode. So before we go, I'll just say uh, you can leave your questions on Guardian Angels Patreon, on Anime Evo, on Lost in America, which is anime-evo.net, lostinanime.com, uh, the Notaku YouTube comments, which is the preferred way to do it, uh, or on Twitter at Satsuken, at Guardian Enzo, at Notaku Pod. And then there's also the email, notaku at animeevo.net. Uh, like, subscribe, review. Those things help us out a lot. Uh, and then Guardian Enzo, any final words before we head out? Like, subscribe, <laughs> review. Yes, please, please. Again, the best way to get what you want is to help us get bigger, right? So help us every way you can. Uh, and the best way for you to do that right now is A, like, B, subscribe, C, review, and D, tell your friends. Yes, there we go. And that, speaking of big things, that wraps up this big, big, big boy of an episode. So we'll see you next time. Adieu, sayonara, and catch you later. Stay frosty.